live bringing you breaking news from Wisconsin. Now, you may have heard that all charges were dropped in this open rescue. There you see Wayne Shung going seven years ago into a laboratory be 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 breeding facility where beagles are bred to be tortured in labs. Uh, he and two co-defendants rescued three beagles, including the little one spinning there in distress. Seven years ago, they were about to go to trial. And then all of a sudden at the 11th hour, days before the trial was set to start, all charges were suddenly dropped against the three co-defendants. But in the meantime, many, many animal lovers and members of Direct Action Everywhere had converged on the courthouse in Wisconsin to show support for Wayne Shung and his two co-defendants. So even though all charges were dropped in this Beagle Open Rescue case, the protests continue. We're going to go straight out to Carla Cabral, who is in Wisconsin live, where there is going to be an extraordinary, extraordinary event that is underway right now. Carla, take it away. What is happening uh, in Wisconsin? It has been a, an incredible week of lots of actions going on. And this is the, the almost the finale. We've got a reunion of beagles that were rescued from Invigo and other breeding facilities, beagles that some had been experimented on, uh, others rescued before they were able to be experimented on. So we have sort of a mishmash of wonderful beagles and a few other dogs here for this Dog Defenders March 2024. They made this beautiful cake right here to commemorate today's event and let me get uh get you some shots of some of these beautiful beagles that are out here let me get down here and show you some of these beautiful beagles hi sweetheart <laughs> i don't know if you guys can see some of the beagles that are out here hi sweetheart uh, there's just beagles everywhere to be honest with you there's beagles all over the place hi and um, these are beagles who would have been tortured in experimentation uh, had they not been released. Correct. I mean, some of them already had been experimented on. I'd say I most of the beagles that are here, I've seen they have the tattoos in their ears. So they were already tattooed. Um, one of them is missing a leg. Uh, I don't know if that leg is missing because of something that was done to them for experimentation. I can certainly find out for you all, um, but there, there's just so many, so many cute beagles all around here and lots of people who came from different states from all over for this uh, beautiful reunion. Um, yeah, so here's one. Let me show you guys this cutie down here. Can you see it. his, uh, his ear tattoo? I don't remember. Oh, poor baby. So this one's got an ear tattoo, and there's another one wearing their Invigo 4000 Survivor uh, hoodie right there, Invigo 4000 Survivor. Can you guys see that? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. All right, let me get this back up. Yeah. So, yeah. Let, uh, let me there's ask just you a question. So all, all of you had converged originally thinking you were going to be covering the trial of Wayne Shung, Paul Picklesheimer, and Eva Hammer. And then when all charges were dropped, you said, hey, we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay. And all week you have done a whole bunch of things to raise awareness about the horrors of beagles being tortured for a laboratory experimentation. Uh, you know, they make them ingest laundry detergent and expose them to drugs and pesticides and pathogens. And we're talking, you know, thousands of dogs. According to the USDA, 61,000 laboratory dogs were tortured in labs in 2016. Who knows now? So what has been the reaction of the authorities who were going to prosecute Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesheimer and Eva Hammer and then decided at the last second to drop the charges. Are they shocked that all these people are there protesting? 
Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a actually a very good reception. We have been uh, all week. We've had several actions every day. We've been out to the Dane County Courthouse uh, twice already. The first day we went out to the courthouse to ask the DA to prosecute Ridgeland Farms for the criminal animal cruelty that we have evidence of. But just in case they are not willing to prosecute, another day we went back to the same courthouse and papers were filed to request a special prosecutor who would be somebody who would look into this and it would be independent from the DA and from that uh, prosecutorial body. So uh, Wayne can certainly talk more about the uh, legal aspects of that. And uh, we also went to Ridgeland Farms. We went out to the location and we had a vigil out there and that was very powerful. One of the neighbors drove past and saw us and she decided to walk back and tell us how awful she thinks it is having that facility right next to her and she's actually gonna get more involved. So it wasn't a lot of traffic, but we certainly are making an impact on the locals that are here. We've been to the University of Wisconsin-Madison twice, and we've talked to loads of students. Several of our people, Curtis and Rocky, were out doing outreach while we were marching through the university campus, and the students were extremely receptive. They said they had no idea that uh, there were beagles being tested on at their very own university. Uh, so they were very receptive to the message. And I think it's really important that we're out here, even though the charges were dropped, that is actually just the beginning of things. They didn't want there to be a spectacle. So here we are with loads of people. We've had multiple dozens of people at all these different locations speaking out on behalf of these beagles and all animate animals who are experimented on. Well, uh, we have an incredible team to talk about this, but first I wanna play Wayne Shung, who is the leader of the open rescue movement, talking about what he says he found. His opinion is prosecute the facilities, not the people rescuing the animals. Here's what he had to say. They got sick of this dog's cries, so they mutilated her vocal cords. And this is just one of the many secrets of the animal experimentation industry. 100 million animals are used in experiments every year. And the industry says it's all humane. Yet that is very far from what I witnessed when I walked into one of the largest research and breeding facilities in the nation. Here are four things that I saw. One, dogs trying to scream, but making no sounds. Dogs in labs who are scared will cry for help. So vivisectors surgically mutilate their vocal cords to shut them up. Two, animals living a lifetime in a cage. Federal law requires that dogs be given freedom to engage in natural behavior, including exercise. But most dogs in labs live in a cage only twice the length of their own bodies and spend their entire lives standing on wire. Three, hundreds of animals are being driven to insanity. One study at a factory farm found that 92% of animals engaged in repetitive behavior, a sign of unbearable anguish within an hour. But here's the fourth and most important thing I saw. We have the power and the legal right to rescue these animals from hell. Animals are not things, but living beings to protect and rescue. If you act, we can save them all. And this is very personal for me. Obviously, I'm an animal lover and an animal rights activist, but I have a beagle mix. Here's a little Wednesday. And the thought of this little beagle mix Wednesday, who I rescued from the streets of Los Angeles, having a laundry detergent shoved down her throat, uh, making her run on a treadmill till she passes out, uh, injecting her with rabies, salmonella, dr drilling a hole in her skull. I don't even like to say it in front of her. It's, it's sick and it's crazy. And why are we doing this? We know that 90% or more of the experiments, something like 96, 7, 8%, 98% of the experiments that work on animals don't work on humans. So why the hell are we doing this? Quick round robin, I wanna start with Paige Parsons Roach, and then we're gonna go back out to what's happening in Wisconsin. Paige. Um, I'm just shaking my head because <laughs> to think that we're using millions of animals in animal testing when we do not need to. I was in my research, I found out that we actually do not need to, and there are new systems being put in place to test on uh, other modalities and that 
there's a 95% of ineffectiveness translating from animal testing to humans effectiveness. So why are we still doing a decades long tradition of spending our tax dollars towards ineffectiveness? And when I looked into why are the beagles being used, it's because they are the do most docile. They're small animals, so they take up less space and they're very cooperative. This breaks my heart heart. So those of you that are out there that are listening to this, that love animals, that love dogs, we have the power to make the change by making a phone call, signing a petition. We're going to learn more about that as the show goes on. And uh, The Intercept did an in-depth piece called Bread to Suffer about the prosecution of Wayne Shung and Paul Picklesheimer and Eva Hammer when they went in, including um, concluding that they are forced to ingest laundry detergent, d drugs, and pesticides. So what I have to say to you people is ultimately this is a consumer issue. If you do not check the label of every single thing you consider buying, and if there isn't a leaping bunny on the back, don't buy it because it's experimented on animals and people think, oh, well, they're not gonna do some soap that they've had around for 50 years. Yes, they keep experimenting because they wanna put new and improved. And every time they put new and improved on a product, which they have to do all the time to keep people buying, they torture animals. So quickly, a little bit more of a round robin, Ellen Dent, then we're gonna go back out to Wisconsin. Uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, it's just absolutely sickening. Uh, anybody who's seen the videos uh, from these, you know, so-called labs, you know, because what are they really experimenting for? It's just complete sadism um, to treat other animals this way. And then, like you said, it's completely ineffective. Their anatomies are so different from ours. And I mean, it is 2024. We have technology. We have simulations. We have AI. There is absolutely no excuse uh, for still using other animals for human uh, experiments, for experiments that are meant to benefit humans. Um, and there's no reason to use them at all for any experiments, even for other animals. Uh, we have we have so many innovations now. Uh, so if anybody um, is out there, share this, share this with everyone. Uh, we need to empty these cages. We need to get animals out of this hell um, that is their reality um, inside of these horrible facilities. Uh, Michelle Celestino, quick thought. Well, I was just looking at all the images. I think this is a pivotal case because all of this groundswelling of awareness and attention is, is getting actual media, other media outlets to cover it. Cron in the Bay Area talked to Paul Picklesheimer. The New Yorker talked to Wayne after he got out of jail. I think we're at a pivotal point right now where um, the public is learning about this and we're talking about dogs. It's going to pierce that cognitive dissonance veil and people are going to see that there is no difference. We're, we're, we're experimenting on animals, on, on our, our pets, our loved ones, our family members. I think this is the case that can really do it. That Lindsay can really Baker. hopefully. Yeah. We're just going to, sorry to cut you off, but very okay. good points. Go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah. I just, you know, every, everything's kind of been said that I would have said, except that when you watch the video footage of Wayne, he actually, yeah, actually step by step the torture these animals go through unnecessarily we know it's pure evil because these tests are simply done for monetary reasons they're done in order for these companies to put new and improved on their labels these animals are disposable they're just considered things but once this gets out to the public people love dogs and beagles come on snoopy guys this has to get out. We need people to share this out. So, yes, this is amazing what's going on. Here. And our tax dollars are being used for all of this. So we want to go straight out again to Carla Cabral, who is live in Wisconsin. Again, remember, they were spent seven years, seven years getting ready to prosecute Wayne Shung, Paul Picklesheimer, and Eva Hammer for going into that laboratory beagle breeding facility in Wisconsin. Then just days before the trial was set to start, suddenly dropped the charges. Um, Carla, what, what do you have going on out there? Um, so yeah, things are, are starting to get ready. The, the march is going to start soon, but I wanted to bring 
uh, Dee Dee to you here. Dee Dee is mom to Clover right here. This is Clover. What? Hi, sweetheart. Wow. <laughs> Very cute. So, Dee Dee, you want to tell us a little bit about Clover? Sure. Clover was actually one of the first families to be rescued from Invigo. I fostered his mom and all eight of her puppies, and Clover was one of those. The puppies were four weeks old, and Clover here actually was missing a foot. It was an open wound at the time, and since then, he actually has had to have surgery on his other leg, and we've actually had to have his half leg fully amputated because it was causing issues. But he's getting along really well now, and he is just the absolute sweetest, sweetest puppy. They are very forgiving, are they not? Even though we humans have tortured them, they still have the ability to love. Absolutely. Even last year, he had to have 25 vet visits for all of his issues, and he just was in good spirits in all of them. Well, you, you are a dog owner. What do you make of the prosecution saying the criminals are the people going in there and showing what's happening? Yeah, I, I just, I can't imagine going to work and doing what these people do. I just, I can't fathom it. The, the love that these dogs have and they're, they're part of our family. So I, I just don't understand how somebody can, can do what they do and feel okay. Uh, always follow the money. It's about money. And when, when there's money at stake, people do all sorts of terrible things. This breeding facility and others like them are not a nonprofit. So what would you say? Do you check when you go shopping to make sure there's a big money on everything that you um, I do think I try to be aware. I think that I could be a lot more aware. And I think since adopting Clover, I'm a lot more aware of what's going on. I honestly didn't know there were this, this many facilities like this right here. And this one here in Ridgeland Farms is just practically right in my backyard. I had no idea it existed. Uh, thank you so much for all you do. We really appreciate it. So, Carla, uh, I got to get back to the authorities, okay? Uh, they had spent seven years getting ready to prosecute Wayne Chung, Paul Picklesheimer, and Eva Hammer for going into this laboratory beagle breeding facility in Wisconsin. Why do you think at the 11th hour, right after seven years of preparing for prosecution, they decided... Uh-oh, we're just not going to prosecute. And guess what? The people who could have gone to prison for 16 years each were not happy about it because Wayne and the others wanted their day in court. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Wayne, Eva, and Paul were very upset that they and their families and everybody had been put through so much uh, in order to get prepared, not just for the trial, but the idea that they could spend up to 16 years in prison. Uh, so when the prosecution came forward, they put the case on that uh, the owner of Ridgeland Farms said that they were getting death threats, that they were being threatened, and that, um, sorry, they're just getting ready to start the march, but the, it was put forward that they were getting threats and they just didn't want to go through with the trial anymore. But there was also evidence based on statements that were made by the owner of Ridgeland Farms in several articles that they knew that we were going to be here in town and they felt that our putting a spectacle on out here would get in the way of justice. So they decided to drop the charges. And uh, based on our interview with Wayne Shung, I wanna read from an Unchained TV article. He said, we sent a subpoena to the company asking them for certain records regarding the actual treatment of the animals at their facility. And lo and behold, a week and a half after we sent that request, which was legally binding because they have to give us these documents because we're entitled to defend ourselves, the prosecution suddenly lost interest in the case. And he said the second reason was a motion filed uh, by his team arguing that they were entitled to rescue these animals under certain Good Samaritan provisions of Wisconsin law. The legal principle behind this, which is called legal necessity, has implications far beyond this case. And I'll continue to show his open rescue. You know, the, the rescuers who are prosecuted for this videotape themselves. So it puts the whole criminal justice system on its head. Normally prosecutors love the idea of having a quote unquote crime caught on tape, 
in this case, the alleged criminals videotaped the crime because they don't consider it a crime. They consider it a rescue. And then they broadcast it to the public and the media. And then the prosecution generally tries to hide the videotape of the crime because it shows what's really going on. And they know that jurors are likely to respond to it. So it's an upside down world. And essentially, these folks, Wayne, Paul, and Eva, wanted their day in court to argue that they have the legal right to rescue animals because animals are not things. Um, Ellen, do you want to weigh in on that as the head of Animal Alliance Network? I just want to say justice for who? You know, uh, this isn't justice for the Beagles, them dropping this case. Uh, the public deserves to see the truth. They deserve to see what is happening to these animals. Um, they deserve to know uh, which products are, are using these animals for testing. Uh, so I, I just want to say that people should choose not only just cruelty-free, but also vegan, um, just to make sure it's, it's completely cruelty-free. And, uh, you know, get all animals out of cages. I mean, this heart, this footage is absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, you know, you just want to save them all. You want to get them out of there. You can imagine yourself uh, being inside of this cage, uh, being poked and prodded all day. Just to, I mean, these dogs, they need to be running around. Look at them. They're running around in circles. Um, this is distressed behavior. I, I'm no expert, but I think we can tell one another animals in distress. And, and that is what we are seeing here. And it's absolutely unacceptable. It's absolutely barbaric. It is wrong. And people need to know. So please, everybody share this. Um, tell everybody that you know this is what happens when you don't choose cruelty free and i have to say that as this is going on wayne shung who is the leader of the animal rescue movement and who is an attorney who just had an opinion of his published in the harvard law review while all this is going on there is a move to prosecute other open rescuers and i i want to show you what's going on with some of these folks um, now, if you look at this, this was a case where a Baywatch actress, um, Alexandra Paul on the right, and her co-defendant Alicia Santurio rescued two chickens who were destined to go to slaughter. They were on a truck bound for slaughter. Wayne actually was involved in the defense of these two women. They were acquitted, but it doesn't stop the basically the authorities, while completely ignoring animal cruelty going on in factory farms, to continue to try to prosecute um, other people who are involved in these animal rescues. Uh, to wit, there is Zoe Rosenberg, who is also very upfront about that she rescues these animals from the horrors of factory farming, and she is facing a potential 20 years in prison for a case in California. Listen to this. I am facing over 20 years in prison for rescuing criminally abused animals. Last week, right after my friend Wayne was sentenced to three months in jail for his work to help animals, I led a group of supporters to the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office to re-report criminal animal cruelty. As we approached, an officer shouted my name, at first, I was excited because I thought they were coming to me for animal cruelty evidence. I was about to explain everything to him and hand him my folder when he said that he had a warrant for my arrest. I was immediately handcuffed and taken to a police car. They sat me down in an interrogation room. A detective from the Petaluma Police Department came in and told me that she had a second warrant for my arrest. She told me that they were charging me with five counts of felony conspiracy and three misdemeanors, including theft. Oh, uh, she is she out there with you, Carla? She's I know she has to wear an ankle bracelet for her upcoming trial in California. She actually is not out here. She was going to come out uh, during one uh, time that we were in the courtroom. The Her lawyers asked if she could have permission to come out here to help with the trial. And she was allowed to come out for that, although she is not allowed to be near Wayne. In fact, there are many people who are not here today because of this stay away order. There are 14 people, close, close friends of Wayne Shung who are not allowed to be within a hundred yards, no communication at all. So although Zoe was allowed to come out here for the trial, because the trial was canceled, she was no longer allowed to just simply come out here. So she is not here. She's not able to give her voice from here. She is watching things. We're, we're sending videos so she knows what's happening here, but she can't be here. 
Uh, this is so outrageous. And I have to say, I want to do a round robin. Maybe you could get closer while we wait it to what's happening there with uh, Carla with this, and then we'll come back to you. But I want to do a round robin. Now, um, Paige, what do you make of the fact that here we are, you're a taxpayer in California, I'm a taxpayer, so is Michelle, so is Lindsay. Um, we passed Prop 2, which is an animal welfare proposition. We passed Prop 12 as voters. They have yet to have a single prosecution based on a violation of Prop 2 or Prop 12, which requires certain treatment for animals. But we're spending millions of dollars, millions of dollars prosecuting people who are rescuing animals. And while I'm afraid to walk my dog after 10 o'clock, I have two dogs and this is my beagle uh, mix Wednesday, which is why she's part of this show. But I'm afraid to walk my dogs after 10 30 at night. But meanwhile, when uh, activists go in to try to enforce Prop 2 and Prop 12 in California, this is what happens. A police army shows up. What do you what make do you of this as a taxpayer in California, Paige? Well, the, what I'm shaking my head about is that, you know, I became somebody who, who learned the truth eight years ago about what's happening with animals on this planet and the way we breed them to, well, experiment in this case, uh, along with the food food that, uh, you know, many people eat uh, still, and I was eating. Um, and to me, when we're breeding, we're, the, the taxpayers are unaware that they're paying for this breeding system, the breed to feed, the breed to test, the breed to experiment on, um, that that is, those are my tax dollars. And so I became an activist uh, with my voice to spread a me spread the message of, hey, you probably don't know this in your neighborhood, and uh, you, to to see the the army of of uh, police out there um, when people are sitting with flowers is uh, mm -hmm. to me outrageous. It okay. is this is a movement of peace to make an impact, to speak out, to speak mm -hmm. the truth, and to get the word out. Yeah, and we're going to go back so, out to Wisconsin with the where there's a speak out going on. Dogs being held in tiny wire cages in windowless sheds. They never see daylight or touch grass. They're sold for experiments that have provided little to no significant contributions in the past decade. With all the significant advances in science and technology, this model of research is outdated and obsolete. It does, however, make the owners of this despicable facility millions of dollars every year. If you would like more information on how you can help us fight to shut them down, please visit DaneForDogs.org. Sincerely, Jamie Hagano, Pet Parlor, Dane for Dogs. All right, and we have one more person that's going to speak. We are incredibly lucky today to have the adopter of Anna here with us. So I'd like to introduce Aura. She's just gonna say a few words before we get started. This is one of the this is one of the Ridgeland dogs. Anna, Lucy, and Julie. So this is one of the Ridgeland dogs guardians. So I'm the lucky one. Um, I'm really grateful all of you are here. When I see the the head of of, of these three and particularly Anna, it just it just brings tears to my eyes. You know, I I think about um, we, Wayne and I were just talking about how sometimes you think about what happened before you met them, you know, and every, every time, you know, throughout the days, I'm always like, I want to make her days better now. Um, I'll just tell you a few tidbits um, from her life. So uh, before I met her, what happened was Eva had called me. No, no. What happened was sometime after I learned about animal rights, I watched a film called The Ghosts in Our Machine. And it's a really beautiful portrait of animals, but unfortunately animals stuck in our horrible system that has every industry on earth using animals. And in one of the scenes on there, that's where I learned about beagle experimentation and it just broke my heart. And so a few months later, Eva called me out of the blue and she said, hey, um, would you like to adopt a beagle? And I was immediately in love without any other words. It was just like, yes. So she brought her from Illinois to 
um, she was fostering at the time. So she brought her to where I live in Boulder, Colorado. And she's been with me ever since. Um, one of the things I noticed when I first met her was that she was scared of certain things that she shouldn't be scared of. For example, she was scared to walk on grass. She's not anymore. <laughs> um, she also liked to eat a lot. And um, at one time she had gained some weight and was starting to find it hard to get up. <laughs> so I had to make, first of all, I took her to the doggy chiropractor. And then um, I learned that she needed more muscle tone. So I made up a game where I could take a few kibbles and run across the room and put them on the bed and she'd get herself up there and then run across the room and put them on the couch and she'd get herself up there. And that's how she dropped the weight. Um, <laughs> she loved it. Um, she, the other thing I noticed about her in the, what it's been like, what, six years or something that she's been with me, she doesn't bark. She never barked. In the rare event where something truly bothers her beyond her tolerance, she croaks and it's super sad. And so it's, I, I'm not gonna try to mimic it, but it only happens when we go to the dog park and a puppy starts jumping on her. She gets pretty indignant about that and she'll croak at them and that's the end of it. Um, but it's happened about five, six times in those years. Um, so I don't know what happened to her bark. Um, she's growing old and um, she has a number of health conditions, but mainly she's just a cuddle bug from the time I knew her. Like the main thing I could say about her, she's just love and per love personified. She just calm, gentle, just heart. And anyone that touches her, is just even in her field, is just like, wow. So anyway, that's what I want to say about dear Anna. Thanks for letting me share a little bit about her. Wow. All right, so we are going to go ahead and get lined up. Um, the sidewalks that we're going to be walking on are, are rather narrow. So just be aware of that. We do have street marshals, so look for the folks in the yellow vest there. Um, We're going to get started there. soon with the march. If you guys have any questions or want to see anything, let me know. Well, I I'm curious, are the authorities out there, we've seen how authorities converge en masse uh, treating you guys as terrorists while refusing to investigate all the allegations of uh, cruelty going on in facilities. This is across the nation, a pattern. Are they out there in force, like observing you? Uh, tailing you? Feel free to no, they're actually, it's been a very low police presence for all of the actions that we have done. Uh, ironically, the place that there was the most police interaction was when we went to a place called Django Bio that was actually closed, and yet there were at least four cop cars that came around and watched what we were doing. We also went to LabCorp which is a facility that uh, experiments on animals. So we were there and there were two or three cop cars that were watching us. But when we went to the university, when we went to Ridgeland Farms, there was almost nobody. In fact, at Ridgeland Farms, there was one police car way up on the actual property. And then one squad car came pulled into the property, was there a couple minutes, and then left. But we never really saw them at all. So Let I think that they were just question. concerned that what? we might try to go inside the facility. But no matter where we've gone, it's been a very low police presence. Um, yeah, overall. Uh, by the way, you're doing a great job, Carla. People don't realize how complicated this is to uh, keep your camera going uh, and not flip over while you're moving, keeping up with a, a march now. The dog march is officially underway. Uh, what is it that you want the authorities to do? I know you've gone to the Capitol. You've gone to the DA's office. What exactly does the protesters, do the protesters want from the authorities? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question? What do the what do who? What do the protesters, direct action everywhere, protesters want the authorities to do? You've been showing up at various places like the prosecution, uh, the 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 Capitol building. Yeah, so there are several requests. Uh, the first request uh, for places like LabCorp or Django Bio or the University of Wisconsin is to drop any ties that they have to Ridgeland Farms. So for any facility that is purchasing beagles from Ridgeland Farms, we want them to drop, drop Ridgeland Farms, so cut ties with them. Uh, when it comes to the Capitol, the day that we went to the Capitol, we were actually asking Governor Evers to veto a bill called AB 957, which is a bill that if it were passed, would pretty much wipe out all the progress that organizations like ours and Dane for Dogs have done. It would be that you can't make any laws that are that would supersede a federal law. So a state law can't supersede a federal law. So any progress that's been made here for animal welfare, animal rights would be abolished. So we're asking Governor Evers to veto that bill, AB 957. And then in general, um, you know, we're asking for Ridgeland Farms to just be shut down because of all of the violations and all of the animal cruelty that we have uh, evidence of. We would like them to shut down with the prosecution. We want them to prosecute Ridgeland Farms for their violations. Uh, those are the requests that we have so far. We're, we're starting the march now, so I'm going to try to get uh, get in the front. Please show us the march, and then we're going to do some commentary while we see your, your video of the march. So thank you so much. There you go. The march to end dog experimentation, and by extension, all animal experimentation is underway in Wisconsin as animal lovers converge on Wisconsin, where it's very cold. I can tell you, having worked for two years in Minneapolis, it's a very, very cold region of the United States. People are bundled up. People are marching now. Well, while we see this march, let's get some thoughts. Michelle, what, what are your thoughts as you watch this? First of all, I am thinking about uh, Anna's owner and how she was talking about how she couldn't, the, she couldn't even walk on grass. And just the idea of these beautiful beagles being tortured and kept like that until they're crazy and cannot in any way like live it is horrible. It's atrocious. But the fact that she was able to rescue her and now she's still lovable and she's got all this emotion to give. These are beautiful animals that we need to take care of. Yeah. Just, and somebody asked, are there any local media covering this? Yeah. So I don't know if you can hear me, uh, Carla, but are local media covering this story? We'll have to find out in a second. Look at them going by, though. This is a very visual thing. I was a local news reporter for many years, and this is a very visual, visual demonstration. And if the local media is not covering this, shame on them. First of all, bad journalism to ignore a protest like this. But, you know, one of the reasons we started Unshamed TV is because... There is precious little coverage of these issues because, well, look at the advertisers, okay? Most advertisers are not cruelty-free. The average uh, commercial is it for a product that involves testing on animals or killing animals for food. Uh, Lindsay Baker, what are your thoughts as you see these folks marching? Well, the first thing I want to say is please, everyone, continue to share this out because we need to get this information out to as many people as possible this protest demonstrates the fact that what they are doing is atrocious. It has nothing to do with you helping humans get healthy. It's just a way to make money by perverted people that put that over humanity. And it's going to continue to grow this horrific way of not caring about other people, other beings, unless we, all the people speak up now so please share this out. And I think this, this march is amazing. I wish I was there. And you're seeing Carla Cabral running to get to the head of the march so she can keep showing us 
what is going on on the streets of Wisconsin. Is this Madison, Wisconsin, Carla? And is there any local news media covering this protest? Yeah, so sorry, I'm running beside everybody. It's such a long line of people. We are in Madison and let me get up to the front. Let me get up to the front so I can show you. Yes, yes, yes. You're doing an incredible job. I can't tell you how hard it is to cover this. Um, There's the Capitol. Wow. Can you see the Capitol? Yes, yes. So you're marching to the Capitol? We're marching to the Capitol of Wisconsin, Madison. Are there Madison, local Wisconsin. News reporters there? Are there local news reporters there? Can you repeat that? Are there local news reporters there? Local news. I don't see anybody right now. We've definitely had a little bit of coverage, but I don't see anybody right now. See, that is an abrogation of journalistic responsibility. I can tell you, I was a reporter for two years in Minneapolis, which is the adjoining state. This, not, not much happens in those places. In other words, they're, they're, they're good. There's not like 20 murders every night, like there are in some cities. This is definitely a news story that should be covered. And shame on the news directors if they don't cover this. I mean, that is just outrageous. This is a very visual story. Michelle Celestino, you were in news for many years. You worked at Syndicated. You worked at big shows. Um, yep. What do you make of the fact that the, the local news media, their cameras aren't marching with this? Absolutely. I am horrified by that fact. This is in every aspect journalistically. You've got the visuals. You've got the stories. You've got empathy for these poor dogs like this is and nothing happens there on top of this this is a top story and aren't these breeding facilities some of the biggest companies in the state definitely this should be covered and it's not being covered and it's really a dereliction of of journalistic integrity for sure I mean, it really is, Paige. This is a good story. You can't get any more visual than this, Paige Parsons Roach. And it's a—it's just, it's obscene that all the stations are not there covering it. Absolutely, I agree with you. And most of the citizens in this town are not aware of what is going on right there under their nose and that their tax dollars are being spent on inefficient testing. Regardless of whether you believe in testing or not, it's inefficient. Efficient. It's ineffective and it's not useful information for humans. You know, there are disadvantages to using animals in experiments such as it's time consuming. It's expensive. They don't accurately mimic how the human body and human diseases respond to drugs, chemicals and treatments. I mean, this is information that's out there for anyone to to receive, but most people are not, don't have the time to research this and aren't aware that this is what is happening right under their noses. And again, if you are upset about this, first of all, I'd like to tell you, uh, download uh, download on Chain TV. We're the only ones covering this. And we are a nonprofit. We are almost entirely volunteer run. I'm a volunteer. You know, uh, we're doing this just to try to desperately get the word out. So please take a moment uh, if you're upset about the fact that the local media isn't covering this, to download Unchained TV. You can download it for free right on your phone. You can download it on any Samsung TV. You can download it on any TV using your Amazon Fire Stick, your Roku device, or your Apple TV device. Do it because together we can do an end run around the mainstream media blackout. If it upsets you that an obviously good story like this I was a local news reporter in Minneapolis for two years. It just, you, you would cover the march. You would be there. That's good journalism. You cover the start. Oh, there's one person with a camera, but who knows where she's from. But that doesn't look like a mainstream media uh, reporter, maybe a, a newspaper reporter. But if you were to do this properly, you would be at the start of the march. You would go with your cameras. I did it a hundred times for a numerous different reports. Where are they? That's the problem. So you have the basic pillars of our democracy, the news media and the government, the two key pillars of our democracy, basically pretending the emperor has no clothes. I mean, pretending the emperor's dress when the emperor has no clothes. I mean, they're, they're refusing to cover this. They're refusing to prosecute violations. 
and we've got to do something about it. There's got to be a groundswell of people. There we go. There's a camera right there. Let's see. We'll take it back if that's a camera. Is that a mainstream media journalist right there? Sorry, I, I can't hear what you're saying. I don't okay. know if you want to see what's going on. There's somebody with a camera back there videotaping. I'm curious to see if that is a mainstream media journalist from one of the local the local organizations. I pray that it is. I pray that it is. I pray that it is. And then you got to see if they actually put it on the air. I can't tell you how many times they sent their cameras out, but then they don't put it on the air at the end of the day. We are looking at live video of a protest outside the Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin. When do we want it? Now. Are we going to get it? Yes. There's no excuse. There's never an excuse. Oh, somebody said definitely not mainstream media. He was wearing one of the green hats that these organizers are wearing. That's so Curtis. That, Curtis yeah. has a, a camera that he's filming professionally with. So, yeah, unfortunately, that was not. I mean, I love Curtis, but that's not a mainstream media reporter. Shame on the mainstream media. I say that as somebody who was a mainstream media reporter for 38 years. The fact that they're not there all over this protest, going live, there are live broadcasts that they can do, and there's also videotape broadcasts. So you know, we we really we're we're in a pickle. We are in a pickle when the government refuses to prosecute violations, right. and then when we uh, our first candidate is Mary Telfer. She is on the board of directors of Alliance for Animals, Wisconsin's largest and longest running animal rights organization. They are one of sixteen coalition members of this march today. Please welcome Mary. Hi everyone. Hi everyone, it's so great. This is so great. Sorry, I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> um, this is just wonderful, everyone. Um, yes, I'm the president of Alliance for Animals, uh, the largest and longest running animal rights group in Wisconsin. Um, I'm excited to see everyone. Of course, I feel sadness for the dogs in Graceland Farms. Um, I'd like to say a few things about our organization first. Um, we've done over the, we've been, Wisconsin's Voice for Animals since 1983, and we've done a lot of things. That's over 40 years. <laughs> um, uh, we've had debates with vivisectors. We've had month, uh, monthly talks about vivisection. Um, we've had a TV show and several commentaries on WORT. Um, we've had a, a ton of vegan events in the Madison area, the Vegan Chili Cook-Off, Cinco de Maya, uh, vegan times. Um, we've had we hosted the first ever uh, Mad City Vegan Fest, um, and if you look around, you might see some of our billboards. We have billboards. Um, if you love animals, be kind and don't eat them. And we worked on all sorts of things in the animal rights world. You know, there's a lot of sadness and a lot of. Um, tough things that you have to learn about, but uh, every now and then, like, it it works, okay? Like, every now and then you have successes, and we have had successes over the years, and it's really important to focus on that. Um, so, yeah, we actually ended the elephant exhibit at the Vila Zoo, um, thanks to Leslie Crocker right there. <laughs> Love Leslie. Uh, that was in the 90s, and um, Winky was the elephant who got to go to a sanctuary. That was wonderful. Um, uh, we were able to stop some pig wrestling events in uh, Wisconsin. Um, and after working with and encouraging the city, city of Madison Parks Department to stop killing geese, they started using 
coyote cutouts. Sorry, I'm very emotional. <laughs> coyote cutouts and other um, uh, more compassionate methods, and they haven't killed geese in over two years now. So make sure to tell the Parks Department how grateful you are and what a good job they've done. Yeah, that was a really good one. Thanks. Um, and so uh, these poor animals, it's so wonderful to see these adorable beagles everywhere. This is so great. Um, and why are beagles tested on? Um, because they have a gentle and trusting nature and they are docile and manageable in size, which of course makes the exploitation even more horrific. Um, beyond the moral outrage, what we have to look at is the scientific fallacy of using animals as prox proxies for human safety. The physiological and genetic differences between the species and ours um, render such testing inherently flawed and unreliable. Countless studies have shown that results obtained from animal testing often fail to translate to human outcomes, leading to wasted resources, misguided policies, and most tragically, preventable pain and suffering for these beautiful dogs. We can't turn a blind eye to this justice, injustice any longer. It's our moral obligation to speak out against the exploitation of beagles and animals used in testing. We must demand the adoption of alternative methods such as in vitro testing and advanced computer modeling, which are not only more scientifically sound, but of course, humane. Together, we have the power to affect change. We really do. By raising awareness, supporting legislation and boycotting products tested on animals. And by the way, I have an app for this. If everybody puts the, it's called Cruelty Cutter, it's an app that you put on your phone and whenever you go shopping, you just scan the barcode and it will tell you if they test on animals. So cruelty cutter. Um, I urge every one of you to join us in the fight against animal testing. Let's be the voice for the voiceless. Let's build a more compassionate society for everyone. And by the way, Alliance for Animals, we are a nonprofit. As I said, we've been around for over 40 years, since 1983. We're all volunteer, we have no paid staff, so all of the money donated to us um, goes towards the animals, except for a couple administrative fees. And we always need volunteers and donations. Um, you can find us at allanimals.org, and or you can say hi to me in a little while. So thank you so much. Fabulous, thank you, Mary. Our next speaker is Carla Cabral. She is a scientist oh turned animal <laughs> activist with a powerful story that gives me hope that the power of science is exactly what will cause the dog experimentation industry to collapse. Let's welcome Carla. She rips off her coat. Go, yeah. oh, Carla, <laughs> Tiffany. Yes. Hi, Jane. Show Carla. Yeah, she's getting ready to speak. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. So yeah, my name is Carla Cabral, and uh, I was asked to give a speech here today, and I hope that this brings some hope to everybody. To the right. To the right. So, so I'm an animal her. rights activist. Mm -hmm but I wasn't always an animal rights activist. Sure. Just prior to becoming an animal rights activist, I was a vivisector. To the right! I worked in research. How did that happen? I mean, as yeah. most of us here, right. I would assume yeah. as a child, I was an animal lover. I adored animals. I was one of those kids who was always bringing right. home oh, Tiffany, to some the right. injured animal that I found somewhere making sure that they were safe and cared for and then letting them loose. So it made sense as I got older that I became a veterinary technician. I got certified as a veterinary technician and I specialized in emergency medicine. So I spent about 11 years of my life trying to save lives. And it was primarily companion animals, dogs, cats, right. bunnies. Perfect. You're usual. To the right. To the right. I spent all those years thinking 
this is fantastic. I'm able to save lives. And then I was given an opportunity to go into the research world. And I thought, okay, this is even better. Perfect. I'm going to go into research and I'm going to save everybody. It's not just going to be one or two or three animals a night. I'm going to help find cures. I was so excited to be part of the scientific community. I love science and the scientific process is fantastic. It really can make a difference. But what we're doing now is terrible. It's not actually science. Science has been hijacked by industry. These are industries that we're working with now. When I started in the field, I was brought in because I could do surgery on mice. So I was put in charge of the mouse colony. And I would go in every day, make sure the mice were well cared for as much as I could. But the way that this stuff works is you are only allowed to give so much care to these animals because they're not really seen as companions. The only value that is given to them is the value of how much you can get from them, what information you can glean from them by doing these horrible experiments. So I was given little shoe boxes in which I could put my mice. We were allowed to put five mice in each shoe box. And in order to give them some semblance of enrichment, I was allowed to give them one little cardboard triangle house and a little square of cotton. And they would rip apart the cotton and turn that into their bed. And I was actually told by the technicians that worked in the facility where my mice were, that it was very bizarre how much I cared about these mice. And that I was the only investigator that they knew of in that area that always made sure that they had this enrichment. And I thought, geez, that's it? That, that's all we can give to them? And it turned out that giving them that tiny enrichment saved their lives because these little shoe boxes were pushed into an apparatus where a metal bit came out that had a little piece that the mice would lick. And that's how they would get their water. Well, oftentimes, just out of boredom, I'm sure, or accident, the bottom of the cage had little pieces of corn cob in it. Or sometimes they would take the cotton and they would shove it in that little, licks it is what it's called for the water. And it would cause their cage to flood. And I would come in sometimes and I would find these shoe boxes full of water and there would be one or two mice clinging on to the top of that little triangle for their very life. And sometimes I would come in and those that were not given that, all the mice were drowned. And this disturbed me. So I went to the head of the department and I asked if there was anything that could be done about this. And they were like, ah, you know, it's acceptable losses. What are you gonna do? Sometimes these things happen. There's no other way that we can make progress in science. We have to do this. So that was my first real blow in the face about how little they actually cared about the animals. And I remember another time that I came in and I saw a new group of mice and these mice were so bored that they would come over, jump onto the little Lixit, flip over backwards, run over, jump on the Lixit, flip over backwards, run back, and they would do this for hours and hours. And you know what that reminds me of? Julie. Julie, one of the beagles that was rescued from Ridgeland Farms, was spinning and spinning and spinning in her cage. This is psychosis. We drive these animals insane because they have nothing else. They don't have people coming to love them and care for them. So all they have is their own thoughts and their own few inches of space. And they develop these horrible behaviors. But there's hope, like I said, I and others like myself that were involved in these industries decided, no. We looked at the facts, we're scientists. 
We looked at the facts and we said it doesn't have to be this way. We can make progress, quite possibly better progress, faster progress, progress that is more specific to our needs if we actually stop experimenting on animals. As has been mentioned before, over 90% of the animal testing does not translate to humans when it goes to trials. But this isn't enough for the industries because it's about money. They care about money. It's going to take us stepping out of these industries, talking to people. I don't think I'm a monster. I was called a monster several times for what I did. So please be patient with the people who are working in these industries. I promise you, if you bring them the facts, logic, many of them will see that, like myself, and make the switch so that we are no longer hurting these animals, but instead helping them. Thank you. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Carla. Wow. Right, we're going to head down and we're going to walk down this street right here, stay along the sidewalk. And uh, Eva, are you ready to do some songs? Steady up. Just be steady. <laughs> wow. Carla, amazing speech. You gotta keep on oh walking forward. Gotta keep I on walking forward. I did not know you gotta were keep a former on vivisector. I didn't know you were a former vivisector. Wow. Wow. What a mind blower. I want to get some reaction from folks uh, who are our panel. Paige, uh, what is your reaction to this? We'll keep the video on the march. Okay, well, science has been hijacked by industry is what Carla said. And I, I, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I'm just dumbfounded. Uh, you know, I, I know uh, many people who are stuck in the system um, of, uh, of that system and many that are going to be veterinarians for the future. Um, and I'm, I'm um, moved to tears, honestly. Um, that's, that's it. I'm just moved to tears. <laughs> Yeah. It's personal for you, isn't it, Paige? Yeah, I don't really want to say any more, but yeah, it's personal. Um, I have a nephew who uh, was in the system of making sure the animals were, um, were treated kindly in the testing facilities. And when I first learned about that, I remember thinking, I mean, he was going through his own, um, you know, uh, PTSD uh, uh, about the things that he had to do. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, it's it's personal. I'm just gonna leave it there. But it makes me emotional to think of the the animals, but also the humans that are being um, exposed to this, being forced to, in the name of science, um, and in the name of uh, what they have to do in order to become um, something that they want to help animals. So yeah, you're raising an important point. It brings me to tears, too, is that we're traumatizing people, the human beings who have to kill these animals, the human beings who have to go there, because a lot of times they're told, if you want to be a vet, if you want to be a doctor, you've got to do this. So, um, you know, Lindsay Baker, what's your reaction uh, to the fact that the people who are doing this just like Carla, a lot of them don't want to do it and they're traumatized. Yeah, I mean, as far as hitting home, um, first of all, I want to say when I started, heard the story about the mice, it just brought me back to a uh, conversation I had with someone yesterday about when they were younger and they kept snakes and they really didn't have that much uh, cognizance of how sentient mice are. It just broke my heart. But um, back to your question, I just think it's so cruel what happens. And I have a nephew that works in uh, animal agriculture in a meat packing plant. And I've seen his trauma and he simply, I mean, where he lives, he simply can't get any other job. And they tried to keep it a secret from me. And I have seen his daughter also, she worked there and she couldn't take it. It's so toxic. And it's so uh, detrimental to these people. It's a crime all the way around. It's a crime to humanity. Ellen Dent of Animal Alliance Network. 
Uh, first of all, uh, Carla, thank you for being so brave and sharing your testimony. Um, you know, that was not hard. That was not easy to do. I mean, that was very hard to do, I'm sure, um, to speak about that and, and to go relive that trauma of, you know, having to treat animals, uh, you know, in such horrific ways, uh, you know, for your job, for, for your career. And thank you for, you know, leaving that um, to help, you know, liberate them from, you know, this this hell that they're living in. Um, you know, you're taught in these industries uh, where they harm animals, whether it's animal testing or in a slaughterhouse or, uh, you know, in a zoo like I used to work in to be uh, objective, objective to their suffering and to their deaths. But let me tell you, they are not objects. They are living sentient beings and they deserve to be free and, and loved and, and to love their families just as much as we do. So I, I just want to make that point very clear that they are not objects. Um, so thank you so much, Carla. Um, and thank you to all these activists out there braving the cold, giving up their time uh, to be out there to take a stand against this. And, you know, one of the things that I want to say is when we see the lack of mainstream media coverage, because we want, I want to be wrong. I mean, I started this because I spent 38 years in mainstream media and I see that they're shut down. And Michelle also, Michelle and I used to work at KKL TV back in the 90s. Um, we know the way media is supposed to work. This is a good story. This is a visual story. It's got all the elements. The fact that the mainstream media isn't there, that suppression of the news, is that not correct? Michelle. Absolutely. And I just want to say all it takes is a picture. You see a picture of the beagle in the cage and you're going to be affected. And this is what they're preventing. Just a glimpse of or just a little information of what's going on. People will be in an uproar. And that's what we need for people to be aware and that they're preventing that from happening. They meaning um, the government that's colluding with these huge companies, that's colluding with the media, mainstream media. This is this is something that people need to know. I had no idea. I was vegan for so many years. I had no idea. I didn't make the connection. And the the little message of knowing this would change everything. And the, the gentleman you see right there with the camera, he is with Direct Action Everywhere. That's Curtis. Um, and Curtis is a member, a leading member of this organization. So the green hats are being worn by uh, the members of Direct Action Everywhere and their supporters. And there you see, this is history, people. Everybody watching this, this is history in the making. They are going up to the Capitol building in Madison, Wisconsin, and making their voices known. But if a tree falls and no one hears it, I want to say also, uh, researching other movements in the past, I was very, very struck. I remember I went to a famous civil rights museum in Birmingham, Alabama, where they explained one of the reasons why the African-American churches were more political was that the local news media of the day refused to cover anything that happened in the African-American community. So the, um, the church leaders became the news as well as um, religious leaders. And a lot of the stuff that should have been discussed in the newspapers, which were ignored, were discussed at church. So you see this pattern when it comes to oppression over and over again. And, uh, you know, I'd love to get the thoughts of those folks here who are on the panel. Um, the fact that it's, it's obscene that there is not coverage of this uh, in this market. Um, Ellen, you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, it's just it's complete injustice um, that we're looking at when we don't have mainstream media out there covering this. Uh, they knew this was happening and they knew that they should be there and they should be unbiased in what they choose to report. And this is news. This is history. Um, these activists have shown that actions like these are effective and they do make change. Um, so they should absolutely 100% be out there reporting it. But if they won't be, um, then thank you to Unchained TV and thank you to everybody watching who's sharing this. We can amplify this story. We can do exactly as they did in black churches and get this story out there. And Lindsay, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to echo that everyone can become a citizen journalist in a way or a content creator 
and and just share it out on their social media, particularly people that are very, you know, well versed in how to do that. And everyone can take part in uh, making this change happen. You can call your local networks and complain. Why aren't stories like this covered? We want to see this. Um, this is a huge part of the local news. Why aren't you doing your job? And so on. Speaking out, just keep speaking out. Do not turn away. I heard a, a couple of my friends came on and they said, oh, you know, we wanted to watch this, but it's just too hard to watch that. You know, come on. We have to, to you know, we have to we have to change. We have to be accountable and we have to stand up for those that that don't have a voice. Yeah. And if it's too hard to watch, imagine what it's like living in one of these facilities. I, I mean, sure. I had trouble editing the videos to get ready for this segment. It's it's not easy. Oh, hold on. Let's go back to what's happening. Thank you so much. Here. Oh, um, wow. Let's go yeah, back. 2017 is a long time ago when when we made this decision to investigate Ridgeland Farms and ultimately rescue three animals and, and yes, to, to risk our freedom. And for me, it was it was something that I, I only could have done knowing that people really care about this. This is something that, that is so important. That people do not want animals to suffer and that people are willing to speak up for it. Because just a little while before that, sure, I was someone who cared about animals, but I, I wasn't someone who was able to speak up. And, and the reason for that, the one reason for that is because I didn't know anyone else who was. So when I see all of you here today and and see see the crowd of you and, and the passion that you have, I I know that that's really what makes it possible for, for people like Paul and, and Wayne and, and myself to be able to take risks because we know that we have a community behind us. It, it was also a long time ago in, in a lot of ways. I mean, in, in 2017, it, it was impossible to get a new drug approved for, for use in the U.S. without animal testing. It was, it was a different time when the FBI was investigating us for, for a few years for this rescue. And a lot has changed since then. Right after the charges came down, right after the state, Wisconsin decided to prosecute us, the, the Invigo investigation happened, which led to the shutdown of, of that facility and the rescue of, of so many of these dogs here today. Public opinion is changing a lot on this issue. Every, every time it's measured, every time it's measured, more and more people are opposed to animal testing and more, more and more people are holding pro-animal positions. This is a way that society is changing more and more every day and makes it safer for all of us to, to hold this belief. And so if you ever feel like it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter if you come to a protest, if you ever feel like you're just one person, just know that just having one person, just knowing one person in our lives is, is enough to make the difference for, for many people to feel like it's okay to express an, an opinion on, on being pro-animal or feel like it's normal to come out and speak up for individuals who can't speak up for themselves. For me, I know that that was the big difference was just knowing people, was just knowing that there's, I don't know, 20 people that I know who would who would do something for this issue. And so you just being one person really, really makes a huge difference in what kind of world the people you know are, are living in. So I just feel so much gratitude for the people here today, people here who are willing to, to come out, spend a Saturday speaking up for, for animals, speaking up for dogs used for research. I feel so, so much gratitude for for individuals who are caring for these dogs, who, who rescue them and who are willing to spend their lives um, caring about all these little, all these all these little quirks that animals get who are, who are truly traumatized by what they've been through. And yet the, the patients that I'm seeing and caregivers who are willing to, to work with these animals and really treat them as members of their family, even if they were you know, born just to be given a number. And I, I feel just, just so grateful for Dane for Dogs, for people who are doing political organizing around this, who are really taking that public opinion that, that is changing every day, that is really getting stronger every day to pr protect animals and, and harnessing that into something that's really gonna change things, that's really gonna use our voices for good. I feel so grateful for, grateful for all of you and I, and I really feel, seeing all of you here today feel, makes me feel so inspired and, and so much hope. 
that we'll see the end to this in our lifetimes. Because things are changing every day, and I, I really do believe that animal testing is on its way out. That the complete futility of this exercise of, of testing on animals is really being shown. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Eva. Our next speaker is Kim. Kim is Charlotte's mom. Charlotte is one of the Invigo beagles that Dane for Dogs adopted out in 2022. And Kim sees every day what it's like to live with an Invigo beagle. Kim. I just wanted to um, read a letter to the editor that I wrote a couple weeks ago. It, um, it was in the Cap Times. Closer. Okay. So, dear editor, in August of 2022, my family rescued a former research puppy mill beagle. Who is known only as CKICET and used solely to breed more dogs to make more profits. She had never been outside of a cage and set foot on grass. She startled at loud noises and had such severe separation anxiety, I thought she might jump through a glass window. But she was one of the lucky few who made it out. Now she gets to enjoy a warm bed, backyard to roam and a loving family like every dog deserves. There are thousands more dogs like her, including right here in our own backyard at Ridgeland Farms. On March 18th, three brave people were supposed to stand trial for rescuing these suffering dogs from this facility and giving them the life they deserve. In reality, Ridgeland Farms and the other research puppy mills across this country should be on trial for their cruel mistreatment of these living, breathing, feeling creatures. It's time we get our priorities in line and protect the innocent and the suffering. Thanks, Kim. All right, we're gonna keep walking down to the next corner. Uh wow. Oh, this is so powerful. And what, you know, we're watching history today. Carla, uh, try to put in perspective of, you know, you've been there for the whole thing. They've gone, they've submitted petitions, they've demanded the district attorney investigate what's going on at the beagle breeding facility. Uh, look at the beagles there. Look at all those beagles walking. And those are the rescued beagles. Just to give a little history, um, it was uh, several years ago. Uh, PETA did a major undercover investigation into the Invigo Beagle breeding hellhole, as they put it, in uh, Virginia. And uh, ultimately, they were able to get it shut down. 4,000 approximate surviving dogs were transferred out for adoption. And you just met uh, the parent of one of those dogs who spoke at that um, at this march, at this ongoing march. And this is history happening, history in the making. And so, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm blessed that, that Carla is bringing us this today after speaking so eloquently about how she used to be a vivisector and is basically doing a living amends um, and uh, devoting her life, uh, devoting her life to exposing this. Uh, people are walking through the streets of Madison, Wisconsin on a Wednesday. No sign of other mainstream media. I'd like to be wrong on that, uh, Carla. Uh, describe the scene here and the historic importance, the historic importance of this. Sorry, having trouble with my mic there. Yeah, I mean, this is truly historic to have so many people come from all over, people who were able to adopt the beagles that were, uh, you know, saved from Invigo as well as other beagle breeding facilities. Uh, coming here to the Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin, we're here to ask the governor to veto a bill that would abolish lots of different animal rights laws that have been put into place. Uh, we're here to ask that the DA prosecute Ridgeland Farms. We're here to ask if the prosecutors won't take action. 
that we appoint a special prosecutor to look into Ridgeland Farms. We're here to ask the general public to be aware of what is happening every day to not just the beagles, but so many other animals. Yes, I spoke about my experience with mice, but I also saw there are countless animals, fish, frogs, birds, hamsters. I did see dogs. There are pigs. There are so many animals, a lot of whom aren't even counted towards the animals that get used and abused every year for experimentation. So we're all out here, many dozens of activists out here marching in the streets, letting everyone know that we are not going to put up with this any longer. We're not going to stay silent. We want beagle experimentation and breeding to end. And who knows what will be next. And again, some of the people marching are among the 4,000 who adopted dogs that were transferred away from Invigo, the Invigo Beagle Breeding Facility, aka Hellhole, as described by PETA, was shut down after a PETA investigation and direct action everywhere, um, inviting some of these uh, companions who adopted these dogs to come all the way out to Wisconsin in the dead of winter to show their support for ending beagle experimentation. Those people here, they're marching through the streets of Madison, Wisconsin, ban research puppy mills. And, you know, this is a major, major um, march. And when you see those ph photographers there, um, those are essentially people who are involved in the march who are part of DXC. Uh, I want to be wrong. Any sign of mainstream media thus far, uh, Carla? There, There is no other media besides yourself, Jane. Unchained TV is the only media covering this giant march. That is disgusting. As a former local news reporter, as well as, you know, mainstream media host. But again, I worked in Minneapolis for two years as a reporter. This would have to classify as a good story. Look how visual it is. People are interested in dogs. There's a march. Nothing's happening on the weekend. I mean, uh, it's obscene that they are not all over this. Shame on them. And I say that. And another thing I have to say is that I'm kind of fed up as a taxpayer. There you see um, the... Um, why is there a media blackout page? Because look at the advertisers, the very people, the very companies that experiment on animals. Okay. Or they produce animals to be cut up and eaten by people. Uh, that's, that's, it's, it, this is uh, advertiser based media is what we're dealing with in this country. So you have the two pillars of our democracy, which is government and media co-opted by an industry uh, I, I have to say I am absolutely fed up as a taxpayer, a taxpayer um, to see that so much of my tax dollars go to torturing animals for stupid experiments. And also that what we've done here in California to pass uh, Prop 2 and Prop 12, that there's no enforcement, zero enforcement of those animal welfare. I am ready to investigate and I'm going to announce it right here, a class action suit uh, of taxpayers demanding that um, the government, uh, some kind of suit to say, hey, you need to, uh, you need to enforce the law. Uh, would you be willing to go along with that as a taxpayer homeowner, Lindsey Baker? Uh, unmute yourself. I'm sorry. I have a little, I was crying. Um the music is playing somewhere, and I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, yes, the answer is yes, I would definitely support that and participate in the campaign. So, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know where music's playing. What about you, Paige? Would you be willing to be a class action uh, person? Absolutely. Sign me oh. up. I, oh. My tax dollars, I don't want to pay for this. This is outrageous. I'm, I'm frustrated, angry, and disturbed that we're just finding out about all of this and that when if I wasn't in animal rights in this space I wouldn't know we would not know and the media is not covering this and we have the right to know all right Michelle would you be willing to be a a, a plaintiff in a class action suit not to put you for on the sure. spot 
<laughs> for sure, I would totally do that. And just so you know, I think the trend is for animal free testing, like no animal testing at all, cruelty free, all the cosmetics brands, all the popular ones are going that way. Like, I think everybody would be on board to do this. All right, Definitely. well, let's go back out and hear another speak out in Madison, Wisconsin. However, the, the difference between us lies beyond these sentiments. I'm here today with all of you to act on what I believe. Every time animal researchers go to work, they are acting on motivations which are very different. This troubles me greatly, as these people, despite their actions, oftentimes being little less than abhorrent, are in many ways no different than me or any of you. How can such a divide arise then? More importantly, how can we build bridges to resolve this divide? While the proposed answers to these questions may be numerous, I have found two answers that are most impactful to me in my everyday life. First, speak to as many people as possible. For me, this means taking classes from people against the exploitation of animals, in addition to those who directly support it through animal experimentation and research that supports industrial animal agriculture. It also means starting conversations with my fellow students about how we should view non-human animals in society. It is often difficult to hear what people believe, and it rarely aligns with what I support, but I sincerely appreciate their willingness to talk. After all, it is through open dialogue with those we disagree with that improvements can oftentimes be reached. The second answer to how we can bridge divides on how we think about animals has to do with considering what each of us are capable of. We all have unique backgrounds and skill sets, and as animal advocates, we can contribute these things in a meaningful and positive way. For me, I'm interested in ethics, policy, and law. For many of my peers, their interests lie in animal science, communication, journalism, and countless other things. Overall, we must embrace this diversity of background in order to make a difference. I ask you all now, what do you value as you fight against the atrocities committed against dogs and many other non-human animals? Do your values contribute most to mere intentions or do they have the power to lead to meaningful action? I often consider these things myself and admit wholeheartedly that this type of reflection is a never ending process. There is always more that can be done and it is up to all of us to address the world of suffering we share with beagles and so many other living, feeling beings. I am grateful you are all here today to listen to me and everyone else. This is a promising step in the right direction and I look forward to all positive action that the future holds. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Our next speaker is Amy Van Artsen. Amy is a UW-Madison stem cell researcher who is also on the board of directors of Dane for Dogs as our science director and UW-Madison student liaison. Amy. Thanks, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Van Artsen, and I'm a stem cell researcher at UW-Madison. I completed my undergraduate degree in biochemistry here on campus at UW, and my graduate work was also at UW-Madison in organic chemistry and public health. I currently work on cardiovascular translational research utilizing human cells with a significant portion of my research using actual human patient cells that have been provided through informed consent, allowing us to study specific diseases from actual patients in an ethical manner. I first heard about Ridgeland Farms during the summer of 2022 from an article about the three activists that rescued the three beagles from the completely cruel and inhumane facility that is Ridgeland Farms. The initial horror and shock that I felt upon hearing about the cruelty to thousands of beagles happening just 20 minutes from where I live has never left me. I got involved with Dane for Dogs pretty much immediately after learning about the issue of dog experimentation. And to be honest, I really thought it would be so much easier to shut down Ridgeland Farms than it has proven to be. Everyone I've spoken to has expressed horror when they hear about what's happening right here in Dane County. Yet I have been surprised at how many people aren't willing to take an active role in helping us make the necessary change to end the torture. Today, I want to challenge my fellow scientists and researchers to think critically about what's happening and why we are allowing for this to continue. And I want us to reimagine how we approach translational research and science. If feeding beagles pesticides, laundry detergents, and other chemicals is considered science, then I'm out. I think it's important to address that animal studies are no longer required by the FDA to bring a new pharmaceutical or medical device to the market. 
In 2022, the FDA Modernization Act was passed, which authorized alternatives to animal research, um, or sorry, animal testing of proposed pharmaceutical drugs. Alternative testing methods um, give us a variety of options, such as cell-based assays, organ-on-a-chip models, and computer modeling. Organ-on-a-chip or organ chips offer particular promise in this field as they are easy for researchers to utilize and are applicable to modeling any organ or disease state as any cell line can be used on the chip. There is no legal requirement for these animal studies to be used and experiments are not showing value. When considering candidate molecules for pharmaceuticals, animal models are not effective at identifying drugs that will be successful. In 2004, an FDA report estimated that over 90% of drugs that passed preclinical animal tests failed to proceed to market. This means that when using animal models, it takes longer for drugs to be determined as failed compounds, which is both costly and time consuming. Currently, utilizing animal research, it takes approximately 13.5 years for a successful drug to reach the market. If something isn't going to work in science, we want to know that as soon as possible before spending wasted time and money. I don't see any evidence to support the continued use of dog experimentation. Instead, we have alternative methods that are both less expensive and more accurate and produce results much faster. I recently listened to a seminar at UW-Madison where a well-respected professor talked about the importance of the model that we're using to study diseases. And I couldn't agree more about this critique. I'm continually left confused why I would want to utilize beagles to study human diseases. At the most basic level, we know chocolate is toxic to dogs and not humans. Thinking about that fact alone, why would we not invest more um, in moving to models that can more accurately emulate the human body? These models are readily available to implement into research settings and are significantly less costly. As a scientific community, I believe we are better than this. When we fail to take action, we allow inhumane dog experimentation to continue. While I'm relatively early in my career, I know that as a community, we have the collective power to advocate for necessary change by simultaneously advancing science. When I think about my education and my scientific training, the thing that stands out to me the most is the importance of objectively evaluating data and being a critical thinker, even when it means challenging the status quo. We have a lot of opportunities to make impactful, meaningful change. Please join us in doing so. UW Madison and Dane County are known for being a leader in the biotech industry and translational research. I can only imagine the scientific advances we could make if we choose to invest in these novel alternative methods. Throughout my life, I've had the privilege of caring for three amazing beagles. They are the absolute kindest and sweetest. I'm so thankful for my relationship with each of them, and I couldn't imagine the alternate fates they could have experienced had they been born into Ridgeland Farms. So for all the beagles, let's shut down Ridgeland Farms. Thank you. I have a cell phone that somebody may have dropped. Does this look like anyone's cell phone? I think that's my friend. Great. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, we're gonna march down back for an hour where we'll hear from a few more speakers. Lawrence, take us away. Repeat after me. Just wanted to share with you some of the beagles that are that are here. Who's this? This is Teddy. Hi, Teddy. Teddy came from a and was in the pesticide trials. Oh my gosh, so they tested pesticides. Oh my goodness, they do that for 90 days and then pretty much they're done with the dogs. And they'll euthanize them after they're done with it. But this one lab in particular gave them to the sanctuary. That's where we found them. It takes in research beagles. What's the name of the sanctuary? Kindness Ranch in Wyoming. It's a wonderful place that just takes in post-research animals. And it's amazing. I can't imagine my life without Teddy. Fantastic. You guys have any questions? Hello? Uh-oh. What, what symptoms do they show? What symptoms does this dog show from, from being used to test pesticides? Uh, what symptoms, if any, do you see? Uh, as a result of testing those pesticides. We did have to have a polyp removed from his rectum because he had straining diarrhea while he was in there. We can tell that. Um, and as a result of that, we had to get it removed when we got him. But other than that, he's 
it's been a long journey. He used to wake up just absolutely shaking for no reason. The minute he opened his eyes in the morning, he would just shake all morning until he eventually started to get better and better. But we would have to calm him down every morning because I think he just didn't know what the day would bring every morning when he woke up. And um, that's passed, but it took a while for him to get better. Uh, wow. It just shows you, look at that face. And the reason they use beagles is that they are docile. They are famously docile. And so they're not going to fight as much. And that is just so disgusting. Did you say, I just want to double check that this dog has a tattoo? He does. Yes. He has two actually one in his ear. Um, and then one on his inner thigh, which we don't, we don't know if he was in multiple trials or if that meant he was in different facilities. We don't know exactly what they mean, but he does have the two two different tattoos. It's disgusting. And, and let me ask you, are you a, a, a local person? Do you live in that area? I live in Rochester, Minnesota. Okay. So, so just a few hours from here. All right. But what do you make of the fact that the mainstream media is not there? I actually was a reporter in Minneapolis for two years, many years ago. This would have been a great story. It's visual. There's a lot of people marching, dogs. What do you make of the fact that there's no mainstream media coverage there? I think that they don't want to address this. I think that they don't want to get involved in this at all. I think it takes a lot of effort and bravery for someone in the media to come out and, and do this because it's just not a, a popular thing. And I think that it's tied to a lot of universities, hospitals, you know, pharmaceutical companies, and they're, they can get a lot of backlash for making this awareness happen. So that's why I think they're not here. Um, yeah, it's not a reporter who decides it on their own. There's an assignment editor and you, you can pitch a story, but the assignment editor decides. And it's clear that the powers that be have decided we're going to pretend this is not happening. But that's not how journalism is supposed to work. So if you're upset about this, I urge people, uh, especially young people, you become journalists, get in the newsroom. I you used to with piss the... everybody off by doing animal rights stories uh, not... by hook or by crook. Um, when I had my own show on CNN Headline News, I did an animal rights story every Friday. I started out by saying when I was hired, would you mind if I did an animal segment once a week? And they probably thought pet adoptions and they said, sure. And then the next thing you know, I was doing hardcore animal rights every Friday for six years. Once I started, it was very difficult to stop me. And, uh, you know, uh, that's when I, that show wrapped after a good run six years, I decided to do it all full time, do that Friday segment every single day. But what I'm saying is we have to get into these institutions. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. If we are going to have these stories covered, we have to get people. A newsroom is simply whoever's in the newsroom deciding what is news that day. That's why it's important to have diversity in a newsroom, uh, racial and gender and ethnic diversity and religious diversity and all sorts of diversity, because it's the people in the newsroom decide what's news. And um, unfortunately, the people in this newsroom have decided they're going to pretend this wasn't happening. Shame on them. Shame on them. Uh, wow. I just uh, I'm actually shocked because I thought there'd be some kind of coverage. But honestly, I have seen this all over the country. Direct Action Everywhere had one of the largest protests I've ever seen at the San Francisco Ferry Building. I would say well over a thousand people doing a die-in from one end of the Ferry Building to the other. Unchained TV was the only one there. Uh, there was one article in, in a paper showing two people crossing the street saying traffic was blocked. I mean, it's, it's an abrogation of journalistic responsibility, but unfortunately it happens with every social justice movement. The New York Times actually goes back and they apologize uh, for coverage that was slanted, that they look back with the hindsight of history and they have 2020 vision and they see that the coverage was sexist or racist or whatever it was. And they they apologize for an article. Well, all news media is going to apologize for ignoring this social justice movement. That's what I'd, I'd like to say. It's you can't call yourself a journalist if you refuse to cover something like this, this big. It's it's unbelievably disgusting. Let's listen in again, see what's happening. What's happening over there outside the Capitol building? 
Perfect. Yeah, so we're uh, about to have some more speak outs. Uh -huh. Wow, amazing. Our next speaker is Aaron Yarmel. Aaron is a thoughtful, powerful voice for the animals, who many of us got to know when he was getting his PhD in philosophy at UW Madison. While his roots are in Madison, he is currently working as the associate director at the Center for Ethics and Human Values at the Ohio State University. So he couldn't be here in person today, but he sent his speech, which I will play now. My name is Aaron Darmel. And I regret that I can't be a pastor. I'm here. I begin by looking at Eva, Paul, and Wayne directly in the eye. I would thank them for their heroism. I will always consider as my personal hero anyone who possesses the courage to put their lives in freedom on the line in the hope of rescuing innocent individuals from an existence of extreme boredom, torture, and eventual murder. I would then turn to Rebecca, Jamie, Sam, Amy, Lawrence, Jeff, and everyone else involved in Dane for Dogs for their selfless commitment to this cause. If you know me, you know that I generally give careful, nuanced talks where I'm conscientious about messaging and unimpeachable in my citation practices. But I think that this situation calls for a different approach. I'm going to speak directly from the heart and not hold back. Now, much of the peer-reviewed literature on dog experimentation reads like a horror story. Dogs are brutally injured and they're allowed to live with these injuries for a time, and then they're killed so that their bodies can be examined. Dogs are fitted with pacemakers, which are then used to induce heart attacks and death. And I have read accounts of toxicity testing where substances of the most trivial importance to humans are injected into dogs, after which they are killed and their bodies examined. Thank you, DXC for showing the world where these dogs come from. In Ridgeland Farms, dogs are raised in cages, stacked upon cages within the barren log facilities where they will never feel the grass between their paws. Now, I expect that the scope of this suffering is well known to everyone gathered here today and that other speakers are going to cover it. So I'm going to focus instead on the character of the people who inflict it. I'm talking about men like Kim Burns. I'm talking about the owners of places like Ridgeland Farms, as well as their customers, the researchers who experiment on them. Now, it can be tempting to dismiss such people as psychopaths. And I've read the research and I get it. I get why this diagnosis is sometimes apt, but I think that it gives a misleading picture and the reason is that psychopaths are born that way. In my interactive with researchers who are willing to inflict torture and death upon animals, the impression I have developed is that these people are fundamentally good. But through a sophisticated propaganda campaign, they have developed an ability to push that good aside and to do horrendous things. That's what happened to me. This propaganda campaign began for each of us in childhood. Every time we were invited or made to use animals for food, clothing, and entertainment, we were sucked even deeper into a worldview that says the flesh and secretions of animals are merely objects for your consumption, and you needn't consider the beings from which they were stolen. Religious myths of human supremacy dominant conceptions of masculinity, romanticized versions of exploitative human-animal relations and the like, pushed us to see this propaganda, not as ideas foisted upon us from the outside, but as intimate parts of our own identities. I believe 
that this general propaganda campaign leaves impressionable, kind, intelligent, and ambitious young people susceptible to the specific propaganda messages of animal research. Many of you have dissected animals in school when you were teenagers. Let me tell you what practices like that communicate. They communicate that a frog, a fetal pig, or a squid is merely part of a learning exercise, rather than the corpse of someone who had a perspective. And many of you will relate to experience that I remember vividly from my brain and cognitive science class in college. At the time, it was disturbing to me to learn about experiments in which monkeys never recovered their eyesight after having their eyelids sewn shut during a critical period for brain development. Even more disturbing were the attitudes of my professors and many of my fellow students. They did not regard these harms as terrible tragedies that should be mourned. They viewed them merely as justifiable research practices. When I was working on my PhD in philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, I remember a day when one of my undergraduate students missed a class I was lecturing because she was going to attend a training workshop for using laboratory animals. Uh, afterwards, I asked her how it went, and I was horrified to hear that the workshop had involved removing and then reattaching an organ from within a mouse. The content of the workshop is bad enough, but even worse, was the purity of the joyful excitement with which she reported that the mouse survived this unnecessary surgery before being euthanized. She did not appreciate that the beginning of her bright future involved the end of someone else's life. As students progress through their training as researchers, the propaganda just grows more explicit. Animal rights activists, they're told, are crazy extremists who do not care about science. And anyone who expresses strong moral objections to standard practices must be regarded with suspicion and ostracized. Invasive, non therapeutic, and harmful for research in animals is so necessary, they are told, for medical progress that anyone who would stand against it does not care about humans suffering from painful and deadly diseases. As the propaganda continues, it becomes more and more interconnected with a researcher's conception of her own self as she progresses through graduate school, a brutal academic job market, and the struggle to write successful grant proposals and publish. By this point, she's a full member of the cult, and she's ready to pass on this propaganda to the next generation of impressionable, bright, ethical young people. And this is. I believe how good people learn to do horrific things. I'd like to end by talking about what gives me hope. What gives me hope is that I have seen moments when the goodness of someone's soul shines through. I was at a wedding once where I met a researcher, and he told me that every time he kills a mouse, he's aware that a little part of him feels like it's dying. Another researcher told me about a time when late at night she noticed that six or seven mice were writhing in pain because of a botched experiment to surgery. And through her tears, she killed them to end their suffering. And one time, I was out leafleting for a Dane for Dogs ballot initiative. I met a man who used to work at Ridgeland Farms. He didn't go into detail about the specific things he had seen or done. But what he did do was draw an explicit comparison between the nature of the business at Ridgeland Farms 
and the actions of the murderous Nazi researchers of the Third Reich. He told me in his own words that he felt like a Nazi. In all of these cases, there were moments where years of propaganda failed to fully kill a capacity to show empathy and care for the individuals in our society who are the most vulnerable. We need more of these moments. And I believe that actions like the ones undertaken by Eva, Paul, and Wayne inspire such moments. The stories they have shared allow others to discover a part of themselves that has been untouched by years of propaganda and which they can nourish into a new way of life. Thank you. We miss you, Aaron, if you're watching. <laughs> Our last speaker is Wayne Shung. Wayne is one of the three defendants who are on trial for rescuing Julie, Anna, and Lucy from Ridgeland Farms in 2017. He's the co-founder of the Simple Heart Initiative and previously led Direct Action Everywhere, which he also co-founded. He has participated in countless open rescues, faced multiple prosecutions as a result, and yet he continues to rescue animals who are suffering and he works tirelessly to bring their stories to light. Wayne. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. Get it's been um, up in the back. It's been an intense last few days and weeks, as you might imagine, facing 16 years in prison, going to trial on the day that we thought we were going to argue for the right to present animal cruelty evidence, instead having all the charges dismissed because the prosecution accused us of making death threats. But I've been thinking about the last few weeks and just thinking about what I wanted to share today as we closed. And honestly, I think probably the most intense experience I had happened about a week and a half before I even showed up in Wisconsin. That was a conversation I had with my dad. So I'm just recently out of jail, which is a totally different story you can ask me about. Um, but as I was in jail waiting to get sentenced every day that I was sitting in jail, my dad was going through something that was frankly almost bringing him to a nervous breakdown because he's 75 years old. He was born in 1949 in the middle of a civil war. He's fought every day of his life to give his son the things that he didn't have, safety, safety freedom, a future. And every day while I was sitting in jail waiting to be sentenced, he was concerned and terrified that he'd never be able to hug his son again. Because he's 75 years old, he has diabetes, his health is failing. So I got the maximum sentence, six years. He might not ever be able to touch his own son, his best friend in the world again. And so we had this conversation about a week before I flew off to Wisconsin. And he asked me a question, which is really relevant to all of us and relevant to everyone who's passing by, relevant to everyone who's listening in on social media to what's happening today, which is why? Why are you doing this, son? Why do you keep fighting so hard? Why are you risking so much? Why don't you just take a goddamn deal? Go home. Be safe. Be free. And it's an important question. You know, most of us probably would prefer to be in our homes where it's warm, watching Netflix. The three body problem just came out on Netflix. I want to go see that. I'm not doing that. I'm here in the cold. And I'm from California, so I'm not used to this, unlike a lot of you in Wisconsin. All of us have family members we probably prefer to hang out with, have fun with, and clear non-human family members instead of marching around fighting so hard against this incredibly powerful and wealthy industry. But the more deeply you dive into what is actually happening behind these closed doors, the more deeply you try to understand what these living creatures are experiencing at this very moment as we stand here at the Capitol building. Just 20 to 30 minutes from Ridgeland Farms, the more you understand the answer to that question of why. And I'm going to try and answer with just three, just three grim details from inside Ridgeland Farms that everybody on this planet needs to hear. Three details. The first, when we walked into Ridgeland Farms in April of 2017, the first thing we noticed 
is that every single one of these dogs was spending their entire life on wire. I had an experience recently, actually, when I was hanging out with my family in Santa Cruz. Um, I don't know why, but I've become a very big fan of cold plunges and being very cold. So I went out to the beach in Santa Cruz and thought, I'm going to jump in the cold, and this is going to be really cool, a really intense, hard experience. And it was. It was cold, and I like, had some suffering, but it was a lot of fun. But incidentally, the thing that bothered me most when I walked out into the water in the cold of Santa Cruz wasn't the cold of the water. But it was a hard gravel underneath my feet because I didn't bring any sandals. And I spent probably about 70 seconds, 80 seconds walking from where I took my shoes off to the beach. And for two days afterwards, my feet were in pain. At Richland Farms, dogs, not only dogs with healthy feet, but dogs that the company itself, that the government itself have acknowledged are going through extremely painful foot infections and lesions who are in the government inspector's own words having noticeable difficulty standing. Imagine how much your feet must hurt when you cannot even stand up. And these dogs who have swollen feet with lesions on their toes live every single day of their lives. For seven years, Lucy and Anna lived on metal wire with swollen feet. And I saw this with my own eyes. <coughs> Not 70 seconds, seven years of living every day of your life on metal wire. That is reason one why we're out here today. Reason two. All of us have probably had the experience at some point in our lives of feeling trapped, sometimes in small ways. I've been on a lot of airplanes recently. Joe and Jeremy have been with me. We've had some airplanes that were not the best, <laughs> confined in a pretty small seat. But, you know, five, six hours and we're out. Every single one of these dogs at Ridgeland Farms lives in a two foot by four foot cage that is roughly twice the length of their own bodies. That is smaller than a bathtub, ladies and gentlemen. And they do not sit there for five hours on one airplane trip. They sit there for their entire goddamn lives. For seven years, Anna and Lucy lived in a tiny cage. And this is illegal in the state of Wisconsin. The state of Wisconsin makes it a legal requirement that if you're confining an animal in a cage, as bad as that is, if they're exhibiting, quote, abnormal behavior, that is a crime. And once again, not only us, we walked in, and within seconds of walking into that hole, hole I saw dozens of animals spinning in their cage, chewing on bars, clamoring on the walls, bouncing back and forth. But even the government's own inspectors, just months before we walked to this facility, an inspector with the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture walked in and saw exactly the same thing, noting that there are animals exhibiting, quote, abnormal stereotypical behaviors inside this factory farm. That is a crime. It is wrong. And it is happening to hundreds of animals right now. Right now, trapped in a cage, so small they never see the sunlight, they never walk on the grass, they never escape that cage that is the size of a bathtub. That's reason number two, why we're out here. But reason number three, reason number three is maybe the worst one, and it's one that we just revealed in the last week, because over the last few years, we've been working with employees at Ridgeland Farms, because there are a lot of people who work there, as Aaron said, who start realizing, you know what? This is not right. And we've spoken to an employee who described some of the procedures that are happening at Ridgeland Farms. And among the most gruesome is surgical mutilation of dogs without any anesthesia or painkillers. At Ridgeland Farms, because they've got 3,000 dogs and because We're beagles not are very inclined to have a condition uh, called cherry eye, which is where your third eyelid, which is supposed to create a lot of tears and allow your eye to be healthy and function properly so you can see. A lot of these beagles develop a condition called cherry eye, where their eye gland becomes infected, it becomes inflamed. If it's not treated, you can lose your eye. It can grow so big you can't even see. 
And normally, when you have a dog of cherry eye, you take them to the vet, they get anesthetized. It's a dangerous surgery because it's a very sensitive part of the body. No one wants to get stabbed in their eye. They have veterinarians surgically remove that eye gland, and you have to get basically eye drops for the rest of your life because you can't create the tears that normal dogs or human beings will create. But you got 3,000 dogs, and you've got dozens, maybe even 100 dogs every year who are developing this condition. And you have one veterinarian supposedly treating and caring for all 3,000 dogs. What they do instead at Ridgeland Farms is they have an untrained staff member grab this dog, pin her on the ground, while another untrained staff member who is not a veterinarian takes a blade or a set of scissors and just cuts that inflamed, swollen eye gland right off that dog's eye. As she screams, as she bleeds, the employee I talked to called it a bloodbath with blood gushing all over me, all over the floor. And here's the worst part. Here is the absolute worst part. Because all of us have had something like that happen to us, probably. Small ways or large. We've been in some pain. Maybe you've had a procedure yourself. And by far, the most important thing when you're scared or in pain is to have someone who loves for you, care for you when you come home. And what happens to these dogs after they're pinned to the ground and screaming in agony and mutilated by a non-veterinarian without any painkillers is they're thrown into a bloody cage by themselves where they suffer and cry and rehabilitate on their own. These are animals who do not even know what it means to have someone they love care for them. And what's most disgusting and gruesome about this, and as you can see with the beagles we see at this march today, is this is what they want more than anything in the world. This is what they've been evolved and bred to want more than anything over the last 10,000 years. They want to be around the ones they love, especially when they are in pain. And that is the one thing they're not only denied, but they never even get that experience. Not even one time in their lives when they're suffering and scared, and even when they're mutilated and bleeding out in a cage, they will never, not even a single time in their life, be around someone who gives them love. Friends, that is not just a crime, a felony in the state of Wisconsin, because mutilation of animals is a felony in this state. That is an atrocity. That is a nightmare. That is why I'm willing to risk my freedom. That is why I tell my dad, I am sorry. I don't want to break our family, but I have to go to trial because these dogs, no matter what happens to me, these dogs are still being mutilated and caged and traumatized every single day of our lives. And until we get them out, until every single one of those dogs is free, we will fight. And we will not only fight, as the dogs you see here today were rescued from an ego, show the world we will win. Because when people see these atrocities, when they imagine even for just a moment what it is like to be a beagle in a cage who's been traumatized and mutilated and has never even experienced love. All of us on this earth can understand those animals' plights. And all of us on this earth will eventually change. We filed a petition this week with Dane for Dogs for a special prosecutor to be appointed because this system that allows the abuse of these animals, the most gentle creatures on this earth, is broken. But if you fight with us on social media, in the mainstream media, out on the streets of Wisconsin, we will reform and transform that system. And that little dog, there's probably a little dog right now sitting in a cage covered in blood who went through this exact procedure. That little dog who has never known love, who's crying out for someone to help her. She will get the help. She will get the care. She will get the love that she always deserved. So when you ask that question, why? That's the answer. Because we live in a world filled with nightmares. But we can turn those nightmares into dreams. And that's why I'm proud and grateful and inspired to be out here today. Because these dogs from Invigo are living proof that that dream can become a reality. 
So let's not make this the last day we fight for the dogs from Vigo or Ridgeland or Marshall, the biggest in the mall in New York. Let's make this the beginning of a campaign to end the use of all animals, not just dogs, but all animals and experiments. And if we fight, we will win. Thank you. Wow. All right. What a powerful speech. I want to make it clear that anybody, anybody and any corporation mentioned is invited on Unchained TV anytime to respond. Um, let's go back out. Uh, there you go. Sorry, take it away, Carl. We're going to try to get a photo. Well, we're uh, we're going to get all the we're going to get all the dogs that are here up into the front of this beautiful, you know, or set up in front of the Capitol. On, so <laughs> there's a little girl here that's wearing a little dog costume. So everybody's going to get up and front. Let's get the dog head signs up high as high as you wow. can, and watch. then everyone in the back, um, just hold oh. your signs up. Let me know if you have any questions. Well, with the, the well, it's absolutely amazing. How long are you all planning on staying out there? I, this is it. We're just going to get this uh, this photo up and we're done. Uh, and uh, so Wayne had mentioned uh, doing some more actions, legal actions. Um, what's the timeline for that? Do you know? Oh. Great. Sorry. Great question. Um, Perhaps as soon as we're done with the photo ops, I'll see if I can find Wayne to, to answer you? some questions for you, if that's all right. That'd be amazing, yes, absolutely okay. amazing. Great job, by the way, Carla, everybody is is giving you the thumbs up. I can't tell you how hard it is. She's doing the job of a videographer, a live streamer, and a reporter, and a participant at the same time. Wow, uh, really, really amazing job. Um, there we go. This is history in the making, people. And it's it's pathetic and sad that the news media is not there, the mainstream media to record it. So everybody is like, yeah, you rock, Carla, for sure. And um, wow, a lot of kudos to uh, everyone, particularly Wayne's speech. Wow. Uh, just absolutely amazing. This is history in the making. And as somebody reminded me, it's only a handful of people sometimes that can really make history change. Uh, she specifically said it was only a few hundred people who stormed the Bastille. That was her example. But, you know, not that anybody's storming the Bastille here, but it, it takes just a small group of determined people to make history. And as the saying goes, indeed, those are the only ones who ever do. So you're looking at people making history here outside the Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin, where all charges were dropped here in Wisconsin against Wayne Shung, Paul Picklesheimer, and Eva Hammer, who went into a uh, local Wisconsin laboratory breeding beagle facility and rescued three beagles. And uh, those beagles are now living their best lives. Meanwhile, those three individuals, humans, were facing 16 years in prison. Uh, seven years after the rescue occurred, suddenly on the eve of trial, days before it was supposed to start, the state suddenly announced, oh, we're dropping all the charges. After a lot of people and attorneys had arrived here, and believe it or not, the heroes were disappointed. They weren't, most of us would say, whew, that was a close one. I could have gone to prison for 16 years. I'm so glad I'm not. No, they were disappointed. They wanted their day in court. Go ahead, Carla. And Carla is uh, walking around, maybe looking to see if we can talk to Wayne. Let's, uh, while we're waiting. Sure. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so hey, I guess we're marching back hey, to the hey. original spot. And then um, I asked Wayne, Wayne will be able to talk to us in just a minute. He'll uh, he'll give us all the answers in just a moment. Excellent. We'll come back to you the second we see Wayne. Meanwhile, Ellen Depp, what do you say? Um, I'm just like incredibly moved um, by what Wayne said. Um, 
yeah, I just, I can't imagine um, being one of those individuals, one of those dogs and not, you know, going through something so horrific. And then to be just left alone uh, in that cage, um, you know, in that cold, you know, cage, you know, possibly even without like a floor on the bottom of it, like that's just absolutely vile. Um, so, you know, these, uh, these activists out there give me hope. It gives me hope to see uh, these survivors of animal experimentation, all of those beagles that are out there with them that were able to survive and, and get out of there. Oh, they screwed us. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm incredibly moved and I'm so grateful for these people. Absolutely. Paige, your thoughts? Uh, well, the gentleman that spoke, um, I wrote down this quote. This is how good people learn to do horrific things in the name of science. Let's stop putting individuals, human beings, in the place of having to do this testing, which is horrific. And the animals that are innocent they don't deserve to be bred into existence to become a number, to become a test case. It's time to switch the funding, evolve the funding to non-animal methods of experimentation that are more effective. They've been proven to be more effective. And we can take the power as citizens of our own states of the United States of America by speaking out, signing petitions and taking action to make these changes happen now. And Michelle Celestino. Um, I absolutely agree with everybody. And uh, Lindsay said it best, we need citizen journalists to get out there. If the major media uh, outlets are not gonna cover this, we need this to go viral. We need people to see this and react and cover it and let everybody know that this is unacceptable we're in the 21st century. This is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah. And I just like to say that uh, Unchained TV is the only news outlet covering this protest live or perhaps at all. We don't see any other media there. So I would urge you please to download Unchained TV on your phone and your TV via streaming devices like your Apple TV device, your Roku device, your Amazon Fire Stick. We're also on all Samsung smart TVs. We're a global streaming news network. But we... We don't have a multi-million dollar advertising budget like Netflix. We need people who care about animals to spread the word, urge their friends and family members to download Unchained TV and start by doing it yourself. So please take this moment and download Unchained TV. And uh, we are the world's only vegan streaming television network that covers this stuff. Again, just go put Unchained TV, one word on your TV, unchainedtv.com for online as well as Amazon Fire Stick, Roku device, Apple TV device. And we're happy to say we're on all Samsung smart TVs. So once again, you can download very easily. It takes two seconds, really. Just put in the word, one word, Unchained TV, into your phone uh, online or on your TV, Samsung TVs, Amazon Fire Stick, Roku device, and Apple TV device. So um, yeah, if you're, if you're upset about the lack of mainstream media coverage, we are the CNN Netflix of the animal rights world. So please support us by being part of it. It is a nonprofit community app. And yes, thank you. I'm so happy that uh, people are saying thank you for covering this. This is not my streaming network. It's a nonprofit streaming network. It doesn't belong to me or anybody. Uh, it belongs to all of us. So take advantage of it. Make it your own. And uh, so uh, this is history in the making. And, you know, bearing witness is really important. Uh, it doesn't matter sometimes how uh, many uh, people are watching. The fact that it's it's happening and we are watching and we are bearing witness is very, very powerful. So we should own that power. And uh, you're, you're seeing, you know, again, I did work in Minneapolis for two years, same weather pattern as Wisconsin. In fact, I went over to Wisconsin several times to cover stories there and uh, it's cold. This is not easy marching with these giant signs uh, for hours on end. This has been going on for many hours. We've been covering it for over two hours, but these people have been marching 
and gathering for since this morning. And it's marking, uh, you, you know, the apex of a week long series of protests going to the Capitol, going to the prosecutor's office, demanding investigations, demanding that the laws that are on the books be uh, be enforced. We've got a situation in this country all across, in states all across the country, where animal welfare laws are not enforced. And anybody who shows that they're not being forced is prosecuted. So it's it's really, really unfair. Uh, and we have to hold government and uh, the news media to account. And so we've, we've really, really got to, all of us, become activists and take action to stop this. Otherwise, um, you know, they feel like they can get away with not covering this. It's sad. I feel sorry for those assignment editors and news directors who said we're not going to cover this because it's a dumb decision. This would have been a very big ratings grabber. Um, and uh, it just boggles my mind that they are so craven and so beholden to industry that they they would not cover it. But, you know, the universities that they've demonstrated at are very powerful universities. I'm not saying that they said anything, but you know, I was in mainstream media for 38 years. You don't have to some come have somebody come knock on your door and slam their fist on your desk. You do the math, you know, exactly who keeps the lights on. And, uh, you know, uh, also there's the inherent bias of people who are, are not animal activists, uh, you know, uh, they're buying the, the company line that this is all very necessary. Uh, our friend Charlie, who lives in Madison, says, I can hear the protests even with my windows closed. Yeah. And uh, it's just unbelievable. So uh, bring us up to date, Carla. Um, where are we marching and are we going to be able to talk to Wayne? Yeah, if it, uh, if it wasn't so loud, we could talk to Wayne right now. Probably it's just very loud. We're almost at the waterfront. You can see right behind me. We're going to be there in maybe another two minutes. Right. I'll get Wayne. We're here. We're here. In the direction. That's the least we can do, considering that you have been out there marching. And uh, this is this is not easy stuff. It's not easy stuff to coordinate all this. I mean, just think of the coordination that was involved in gathering all these people, the Envigo Beagles, uh, gathering the marchers, getting the signs, getting the bullhorns, uh, coordinating all the speakers. This is a major event. And uh, we got to give some props to Direct Action Everywhere for their ability to pull these kinds of events off uh, consistently. Very, very organized. Uh, also videotaping. I see that uh, Curtis Vollmer, who is uh, an activist, is covering the videotape. And uh, essentially, Carla, your your strategy at DXE is to go straight to the people through social media, and we're happy to say Unchained TV as well. But you're gonna you're gonna plaster all of this all over social media. I know that for for a fact, and that's why you're taking the video. Um, but um, Direct Action Everywhere is very, very adept at getting this information out despite the mainstream media blackout. And obviously they they contact, they have a media department. They contacted every single media in this area. All the media knows about it. Um, shame on them, seriously. Yes, we want justice for beagles, absolutely. Animal lovers. You know, I often say that dogs are the gateway drug to animal rights. People love their dogs. Where I live... Uh, I would say every third person has a dog and they all consider themselves animal lovers. Uh, people who see this get very upset. And I just want to show, I was looking through some of my uh, photos and videos and I have to show you a disturbing photo. Here are dogs in the dog meat trade, the dog meat trade and people scream and yell and scream and yell and it's horrific and it's disgusting but what's happening to dogs in laboratories is also horrific and disgusting. We love to point the finger at other countries and say, oh, they're eating dogs, which is horrible. I agree. But by the same token, what are we doing to dogs? What are we doing to cows and pigs? Pigs that are smarter than dogs. And every time they do an undercover investigation, uh, they come up with the same thing. These animals are being tortured, systematically kept in crates the size of their bodies. And yet... 
people don't like to look in the mirror. Anytime you buy a meat product or a dairy product, you are participating in the torture and murder of animals. Those dairy cows become a uh, hamburger, cheap hamburger. So um, look in the mirror and see if there's something you can do. If you are already plant-based vegan, you can become an activist. Um, I mean, when I was a teenager, there were a huge protests against the Vietnam War, massive, massive, massive. And in the same era, it was a similar situation. At first, at first, the media was completely aligned with the government, but it was after people like uh, Woodward and Bernstein, uh, who exposed what was really going on, uh, exposed the horrors, then the society shifted. So uh, we have to look at previous social justice movements to see that you're not going to get the support of the media or the government at the outset. It's just not the way things go. However, um, if, if there is a, a critical mass of people that is formed, you hit a tipping point. And I'll never forget the demonstrations that I went to as a teenager, Fifth Avenue, completely one end to the other covered with, with protesters against the Vietnam War. Uh, that's the kind of thing we need in the animal rights movement, that level of size. So it's not a social club. It's great to go to vegan restaurants and have parties. Yes, I'm all for that. But it's also every person who is... Um, you know, maintaining that they love animals, they need to get active just like these people are. These people are making the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and uh, here we go. Somebody says, Mariana, I'm here from Toronto. I've been following on Shade TV for two years. And here in Toronto, there's no news about these activisms in the state. Yes. And she's emailed everybody. Believe you. Believe you me. Uh, all this media have been emailed and they've been texted. They know all about it. They're just pretending it's not happening. And, and I'll say it one more time. Shame on them. So as we get ready to wrap up, let's get some final thoughts from everybody. Ellen Dent, uh, what are your final thoughts? Um, I just, uh, I hope that people see the truth. And I know that the people watching this and the people participating will share the truth with everyone that they can. And I, I hope that society sees because once they see, uh, then they have the ability to take actions themselves in their everyday decisions, what they choose to consume. So and I believe I believe that they will make the right decision um, and that they will have empathy for other animals uh, once they know. Thank you, Ellen. We're going to go straight out to Wayne Shung. Wayne, uh, what a speech. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, you mentioned that you were going to continue to take legal actions. What are you going to do uh, right here? What are you going to do in Madison coming in the coming days? We're working hard, Jane, to buttress our petition to appoint a special prosecutor. The county of Dane has refused over the last seven years to even investigate the cruelty at Ridgeland Farms, even though, as I said in my speak out, their own investigators have said they're abnormal stereotypical behaviors, dogs who have, quote, noticeable difficulty standing, all of which are violations of law. And the most recent thing that we've uncovered is by working with an employee or former employee of the company that dogs are literally being mutilated. They're having eye glands cut off. If somebody had a dog with some sort of like tumor or lesion on the body and they decide, I'm just going to hold this dog down, pin him to the ground and just cut it off as they bleed out in a cage and leave them alone to suffer in a cage. And if they're doing that to hundreds of dogs, which Richland has done in recent years, that would clearly not just be a crime, that would be felony animal cruelty, and it's time for the government to do something about it. So we're going to be working hard to, to support that petition, to get statements of support from groups across the county of Dane, the state of Wisconsin, even the nation. And while it's going to be a hard road, in the long term, as long as the public hears more about this, even if we don't win this particular petition, it's going to be an uphill battle because the biomedical industry is incredibly powerful in Dane County, Wisconsin. Even if we don't win this petition, we can win where it matters most, which is the court of public opinion. And I'm grateful to you and Ellen and everyone else for bringing attention and apply to these dogs because it's, it's vile what's happening to them. And, you know, you are facing so many different cases Wherever you go, it seems like you're prosecuted. You were acquitted in Utah for rescuing some piglets. The jury sided with you in Sonoma County. 
California, where all the evidence of animal cruelty essentially was kept out of the trial. You were convicted. Um, then you came here to Wisconsin where you thought you were going to go on trial. They dropped all the charges at the 11th hour. First of all, let's recap and review why you think they dropped those charges. Yeah, there are three primary factors. One was we served a subpoena on Ridgeland that would have required them to hand over their customer contracts because Ridgeland and the government had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these dogs had some value and that they're healthy enough to actually be sold and used in experiments. And so we were entitled to their customer contracts that would indicate how much are you selling the dogs for? What are the requirements under these contracts for the sale to actually be effective? And you know, I won't name the specific companies, but we're talking about some of the biggest names in the pharmaceutical industry and some of the most disturbing experiments you could possibly imagine, including forcibly injecting dogs with rabies and watching them wither away and die and go insane. That's a horrible way to die. And on the day they dropped the charges, the judge was about to rule I believe in our favor that we are entitled to those documents. The second reason I think they might have dropped the charges has to do with a legal argument. Namely, we're arguing in court that day, we were scheduled to argue at least, that animals are not just things, they're persons. And this is a defense to the criminal burglary and theft charges against us because if these dogs weren't things, weren't just property for someone to steal, but living beings with some basic sense of legal status within our political system, then not only did we have the right to give them the aid we gave them we gave them on that day, but in theory, all the other animals were suffering, both at Ridgeland Farms and at other animal abusing facilities across the state and nation, we received that same legal recognition. And I think the industry got wind of the fact that judge was particularly sympathetic to us and was concerned that if they win this, what's to stop people from arguing that all these animals must be free? But the third reason, and I think honestly the most important reason because Ridgeland itself admitted this in a public statement was the concern over exposure. It's, it's really, really ironic and honestly a little hilarious if not for the fact that it was also really scary because there was a prosecution that could have landed me and other people in prison for a long time. When the prosecution dismissed the case, they said the reason was because there have been death threats against Ridgeland. And I just want to point out in my nearly 20 years involved in the legal system as a lawyer, law professor, defendant, and I've asked so many criminal defense attorneys if they've ever heard a circumstance like this where a so-called victim of a crime faces death threats and that is cited as a reason to dismiss the case. That is cited as a reason to dismiss the case. That is preposterous. The actual reason came out later when Ridgeland issued a statement saying, well, actually, it wasn't so much death threats as so much exposure. The only living beings threatened with death in the context of this case are the dogs at Ridgeland Farms, hundreds of which are killed every year, sometimes because they just don't have enough space or because they're trying to even out the sex ratio. It happens to be one year, yeah, we got, you know, 70 or 80 too many male dogs this year, so let's just kill them all, right? Those are the real death threats. And the threat of that exposure, that there would be dozens of activists, hundreds of activists in Wisconsin, thousands of activists watching programs like your program, Jane, and learning about this and amplifying the message and the story that dogs are being tortured at vivisection facilities was such a threat to the industry they just had to dismiss the charges. And, you know, that should lead us to some fundamental questions about these industries. If this is an industry that is so terrified by the prospect of some sunlight being shined on what they do, that they literally have to, you know, drop everything they're doing and dismiss the case and prevent anyone in a court of law from possibly finding out anything about what happens behind their closed doors, we should ask, should these things be happening at all? Wow. Well, um, are you facing amazing, amazing uh, conversation? Are you facing any other charges in other states? It's really hard to keep up because you've done so many open rescues. Uh, just want to just try to get an overview. Yeah, I've been criminally charged in I don't I, I can't actually recall the exact number, but it's probably like seven or eight cases, mostly in the last five years. But this is actually my last active criminal case. Um, you know, partly because the prosecution has to some extent been effective. I've, I'm embroiled in so many lawsuits and litigation, not only criminal, but civil. I've been sued so many times that even if I wanted to continue doing the investigative and rescue work, it's almost like I don't have time. I've got court dates every single week, but this is the last criminal case. I still have a lot of appeals, uh, and virtually all these cases are going to be appealed. The ones we won, obviously we don't need to appeal because we won, but so really what my main focus now is, is not just winning these appeals and developing the storyline and the legal narrative, 
behind the right to rescue, but really encouraging and developing other people to continue this work. And, and that's why I'm, I'm incredibly excited about the future because while uh, this case is dismissed and while you know, I and others still face some consequences, including probation and the threat of imprisonment at any point, because under the terms of my probation, if I even come close to a factory farm, they can throw me in jail. It's called flash incarceration immediately. I know there's so many other people willing to step up and, and that's my hope for the future. Not just hope, but confidence that there will be more people to step up and help these animals if I have to step back. And apparently they also try to take your law license away. Where does that stand? Yeah, so kind of update. Unfortunately, they've succeeded at that, at least in an interim way. I was suspended effective this Tuesday. I am no longer a practicing attorney. We are fighting that. And I think we have a reasonable shot of appeal because the legal standard is it has to be a crime of moral turpitude for them to remove my license, which means not just that I've been convicted of a crime, but the conduct is so shameful and shocking that it, it violates all the ordinary standards of morality in the community. And, you know, what I literally did was take a distressed and abused animal to the veterinarian. And that is shocking and shameful conduct. I don't know what to say about our moral or legal system. So I think we got a fair shot of winning that one. We've actually once won before because they've tried to come after my license before and we won over the long term. But you never know. And a lot of this just has to do with the luck of the draw, which judge you happen to draw. And you happen to also at the ironically, just as they're taking away your law license temporarily, you're published in the Harvard Law Review, which is yeah. the pet, it's the ultimate where the most prestigious lawyers would love to be published. You're getting published in Harvard Law Review at the same time that they're trying to take your law license away. You know, it's it's even more ironic than that because part of the reason I was published in the Harvard Law Review was precisely because they're prosecuting me because the case that I examined and I and I wrote about in the Harvard Law Review, it's called Voluntary Prosecution in the Case of Animal Rescue. It's a piece about prosecution and about my own experiences of prosecution. And it's an indication that the times are changing. It's more and more serious legal scholars. We've had professors at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, all the most prominent universities across the country. Very distinguished litigators like Justin Marceau at the University of Denver support us immensely. And I think the writing's on the wall. One of the reasons they're going so hard after me is because they know this actually works. When we actually get a chance to argue in a court of law, as we did in Utah, even a conservative, rural, rural agricultural jury decide with us. And that's incredibly dangerous, not just for one individual company, but for the entire industry. An industry that even in terms of taxpayer subsidies is getting tens of billions of dollars every year. It makes tens of billions of dollars in profits. There's an enormous amount of money at stake and they see this activism as an existential threat. And so they're coming so hard after us precisely because they know it's working. And, and really, I mean, well, in, in many ways, I'm, I'm the face of a lot of these cases. The reason it works isn't actually principally me, it's you. Meaning the people who are listening to this live stream, the people who are on the panel at Jane Unchained because they're recognizing more and more people are developing the confidence to speak out and say enough is enough. This just has to stop. And the more people who see and recognize that, the more the industry's pillars of support will crumble and it will disappear. Okay, one last question. I appreciate you taking so much time to talk to us. Uh, as a taxpayer and a citizen here in California, very upset that the laws are not being enforced. I'm talking about specifically Prop 2, which I weigh signatures for, and Prop 12. These are two animal welfare laws that were overwhelmingly passed by the voters. Right on this call, we have Paige Parsons wrote Michelle Celestino, as well as Lindsey Baker. We're willing to participate in a class action lawsuit demanding that law enforcement enforce these propositions. Um, one of the reasons you go into the factory farms to document is that you document the, the alleged violations you present to prosecutors and then they refuse to prosecute and they turn out around and prosecute you for going in there and showing that laws are being broken. Do you think there is a chance of a class action lawsuit being followed, filed by California taxpayers and voters, such as the people on this call from being successful? California is one of the states that has unique provisions of law that give nonprofits and private citizens standing when there's a violation of law by a big agricultural or other animal abusing company. And there have been lawsuits that have succeeded in this regard. 
and it's a it's a new form of lawsuit that really has only existed, I'd say, in the last 15 years, based on a very famous Supreme Court case called Havens that gave organizational and third party standing. Because typically, when a law is broken, unless you personally have been injured, you can't bring a case. But California is one of the states where they have been open to this sort of lawsuit. So I think it's a beautiful idea. I think it's just. And I think we have to put pressure on the system in all ways we possibly can, because you're absolutely right. It is a scandal. One of the least talked about scandals that a ballot initiative that received more votes and support than any ballot initiative in California history has not been enforced at all. And it's not just the government is not enforcing it. It is actively involved in covering it up. In our case in Sonoma County, where I was convicted of felony for conspiracy, where all we did was walk in, take some photographs and take some sick chickens out of a Whole Foods factory farm. The owner of the company repeatedly lied on the stand and the government supported him this and said, we did not have battery cages in 2015, 2016, 2017. It's in the transcripts. And we had video footage and photo showing that was not true. They had battery cages in all those years and the government moved to exclude all that evidence from the trial. That's not what the government should be doing. It shouldn't be covering up crimes. It should be stopping crimes. And too often in this context, given the amount of influence and money at stake, the government's doing the opposite of what it should be doing, covering up the crimes. Well, I'm happy to do it. I'm I'm a journalist, but I'm also a taxpayer, a homeowner, a citizen, and I'm sick and tired of these laws. And I collected signatures. I stood outside the farmer's market uh, for days on end collecting signatures. I uh, had a yoga teacher brush past me. <laughs> it was funny to run into people I knew and they didn't recognize me. I was collecting signatures and it was really interesting, but it was a lot of hard work. So for those two, I also threw parties. I, I'm furious as a, as a taxpayer that these laws aren't being enforced. So we're going to go ahead. I personally am saying if it's doable, I would put my name to a class action suit. We've already got a whole bunch of people. People are texting me and commenting that they want to be on board. And uh, let's do it. Um, so get that law license back so you can represent us, Wayne. I would love to. I would love to. So we'll work on it and we'll be in touch. If All we're right. successful at getting my license reinstated, let's have some conversations, Jane. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Amazing work, hero. A man who risked 16 years in prison to speak for these beagles and so much more. We applaud you, Wayne Shung. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to wrap up our coverage. Wow. Two and a half Thanks hours. So more than two and a half hours. Carla Cabral, a mate. Let's hear it for Carla. Because Carla, none of this would have happened without you being out there. Just incredible work. Uh, on so many levels. And thank you to the panelists, um, Paige Parsons Roach, Michelle Celestino, Ellen Dent of Animal Alliance Network, and Lindsay Baker. And I, I want to just get one other panelist before we go. My little baby, Wednesday, a Beagle Mix Rescue, who uh, I look at her face and I say, if anybody ever tried to put detergent down her throat, uh, they'd have to deal with me. It's disgusting. It's ineffective. It's medieval. It's barbaric. It's got to stop. And we're going to stop it. Everybody, download Unchained TV. Join, join, join. Together, we can do that and run around mainstream media. Thank you for watching us. See you next time.